as I showed you with those responders to IL-2, and as we see with the CTLA-4 antibody uh, ipilimumab, um, shown here with about 20% of patients now being on that tail of the curve, which starts at about three years. And there's a picture of Jim Allison, who got the Nobel Prize for his discovery of um, CTLA-4 as a checkpoint. And if you want to learn more about that, there's actually been a movie that's been um, uh, out there since 2019 called CTLA-4 Antibodies, and it's really a great story. But the real workhorse in immunotherapy is the PD-1 pathway and, and blocking that pathway. And what PD-1 does is when it's expressed on activated T cells and binds to PDL1 on tumor cells, the immune system gets shut off. And these antibodies can block that interaction, which can restore the immune system uh, activity against the tumor and allow it to actually finish uh, the job of uh, killing the tumor where possible. And it's interesting that the p tumor types that respond to anti-PD-1 are those which have the highest mutational burden and melanoma because a lot of it is related to sun damage and sun damage causes mutations in the tumors. These are passenger mutations, not the driver mutations like the BRAF mutation. Melanoma is one of the tumors that's most responsive to immunotherapy, particularly the anti-PD-1s. And here's an example of an early patient who had received high-dose IL-2 in biochemotherapy and ipilimumab who got pembrolizumab. And you can see this um, mass on the CT scan, um, that I wish I could actually point to up in the left hand corner of the initial images and also in the liver. And after a year of treatment, it was essentially gone and this patient is doing well now a decade after that. And so pembrolizumab or Keytruda, the drug that Jimmy Carter got was approved for the treatment of melanoma in 2014. And the other anti-PD-1, nivolumab was also approved. So one question people ask is, which one should they get? And essentially, they're the similar, they're identical efficacy in melanoma, either in metastatic disease or adjuvant therapy. It's really hard to tease out that one is better than the other. And as Tony Ribas has said, they're really Coke and Pepsi. And therefore, the choices are largely based on other factors such as schedule, time to approval, marketing, the cost of the drug, or the experience with these agents in other cancers, or the efficacy of combinations. And with regard to schedule, the companies have been playing leapfrog, initially Q2 weeks, then Q3 weeks, then Q4 weeks, then Q6 weeks. So that's where we're at for therapies. And you might choose one of the treatments versus another because you'd have to go to the doctor less. But the real advance, in my opinion, um, that has made melanoma different than some of these other cancers was the early institution of both CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 together, taking these two Nobel Prize winning uh, discoveries and putting them together. And generally people say immunotherapy works slowly, but I think that's actually not the case. As you'll see from this example of this man who has this melanoma on his scalp that was eroding through his skull, had no other treatment options. He got nevo ipi, and these are weekly photos. You can see this mass getting smaller, getting smaller, and by nine weeks, it's gone. And so this is probably what's happening in many patients inside their body. You can't see that because you're not doing a CAT scan every week. But that's quick, and we know that from our neoadjuvant studies, where even disease in lymph nodes that looks like it hasn't changed um, after a six-week period when you take the um, lymph node out, 60% uh, of the time there's no tumor there. So immune therapy actually works quick, and it just may not show up as quickly, uh, it changes as quickly as 
with the BRAF MEK inhibitors. So in the Checkmate 067 study, um, compared nevo ipi to nevo to ipi, and the combination, the red line here, was better than both ipi and nevo single agents um, with a, about a five to 8% difference in the tail of the survival curves out at 6.5 months, 6.5 years, excuse me. And when you looked at the BRAF mutant population, that difference was even more profound with 14% difference between nevo ipi and nevo at 6.5 years um, uh, on these uh, survival curves. But unfortunately, um, nevo ipi is also associated with higher toxicity, and these toxicities are immune related adverse events where the immune system is not only active against the tumor, but also recognizes self. And you can see that um, in the graph in the lower corner that some of those common toxicities are rash or liver problems or diarrhea or colitis or endocrine abnormalities and give a sense of when they happen. Um, and um, they're probably twice as likely with nevo ipi as with uh, nevo monotherapy. But at least in my view, toxicity is not all bad because um, it allows you to potentially stop the therapy and it's also associated with better efficacy. The yellow curve here are patients who didn't have toxicity. The um, red and the blue curves that overlap are the patients who had some toxicity and patients who had more severe toxicity but required steroid treatment. And the upper curve, which just has about nine uh, subjects on it, are patients who had toxicity severe enough to get both steroids and an immunosuppressive agent. So toxicity, um, I view it more as an endpoint because we can usually control it. And it's also an opportunity to stop um, the treatment because we've reached that endpoint. And in the um, 067 trial, you can see that for patients on nevo ipi, about 77% of those <clears throat> patients had been able to stop treatment successfully. And there was 145 patients who were still alive and three quarters had stopped treatment. <coughs> Only 5% um, were still on treatment and about 18% um, were uh, on a subsequent treatment. And so what that allows is for um, oncologists to uh, accomplish the patient's goal, which is the treatment ends, but the benefit persists. And this uh, property has um, changed my oncology clinic to a virtual travel agency where patients who are freed from their melanoma therapy and free from the complications of melanoma are traveling the world, um, fulfilling their bucket list of places they want to go, and also attending milestone events that they never would have thought possible and certainly wouldn't have been possible for most of them prior to 2011. So one of the reasons why these responses are so durable, and uh, Dr. Hamid will talk about this in much more detail, is that most patients with metastatic melanoma probably have subclinical brain mets. But um, nevo ipi works in the CNS, at least for patients with asymptomatic brain mets, as well as it does systemically. So we're not seeing isolated CNS relapses the way we used to with some of our early patients, even our best responders. And here's brain MRI from a patient of mine who had multiple uh, CNS um, metastases here in 2015. And here is the patient in 2022. She um, uh, happens to be a neuroscientist, runs the brain bank at the NIH. And here's a uh, 3D print of her own brain with the metastases there that, that she's standing showing. And as I said, immunotherapy is active in the CNS as, as it is in systemic disease. And this patient 
has written a book about her journey, which I encourage all of you to read. It's quite a compelling story, and hopefully someday it'll be a movie, and if so, I want Tom Hanks to play me. Um, <laughs> so um, this is um, 2011 story of BRAF mutant melanoma. We've raised the bar, displayed the curve with BRAF mech inhibitors, raised the bar with Nevo Ipi. And the question in 2015 was, which approach was preferred for these BRAF uh, mutant, patients with BRAF mutant tumors? And given that patients would have access to both treatments, is there an optimal sequence? So to address this question, we launched the DreamSeq trial, which randomized patients with BRAF mutant melanoma to receive immunotherapy first, followed by targeted therapy if they progressed versus the um, reverse sequence. And so this was the endpoint of the trial was two-year landmark overall survival. And these are the overall survival curves. The one in black is the immunotherapy first curve. The one in red is the targeted therapy first curve. And as you can see, there was a little benefit for targeted therapy early on, but by 10 months, these curves had crossed. And at two years, there was a 20% difference favoring immunotherapy first. And at three years, that difference was 24%. Uh, so this study addressed the question definitively that you should give immunotherapy first to these patients if you could. So why was the immunotherapy uh, first approach better? Well, first, the tumor responses were more durable with immunotherapy, with 88% of the responses ongoing compared to half of the patients with targeted therapy having progressed. As I mentioned, fewer patients develop CNS relapse because when immunotherapy works, it should also work on asymptomatic CNS metastases. Another important factor was that targeted therapy is really a good second-line treatment. It works as well in the second line after immunotherapy as it does up front, while immunotherapy given second doesn't do as well as given up front. And um, when we looked at all the different subsets of patients who were on this trial, we could see that the IO therapy first approach worked better for all the different subsets, including that patient population who responded best to BRAF mech inhibitors that I mentioned earlier. So another approach to try to use these, molecule, these agents together was to combine IO with targeted therapy. And so these are called triple therapies, and there were three studies that were done comparing an anti-PD-1 or PDL one plus a BRAF mech inhibitor to a BRAF mech inhibitor. And these are the progression-free survival curves for all of those studies, both arms. You can see there's a little bit of improvement for in progression-free survival for the triplets versus the doublets. But there's not really that tail on these curves the way we see with immunotherapy. And at the five-year time point for nevo -Ipi, the PFS in the BRAF mutant population was above where the uh, uh, PFS was for these triple um, uh, regimen treated patients. And the nevo ipi treated patients who hadn't progressed could still get targeted therapy if they've progressed, while the triplet patients had already received both regimens. Now, there may be a role, as was recently presented, for um, um, this triple therapy in some patients with aggressive disease. Here's some data. Patients with high LDH and greater than three metastases showing that the triple drug was better than the combination doublet in the patients, but still don't see a tail on these curves, and this tail looks like it's less than what we'd see with immunotherapy for these patients. So in looking at triple therapy, I think it's really um, not something that has caught on with the medical community, even though there is a triplet approved. And um, ultimately, for me, it's hard to identify a patient population who should receive triple therapy versus sequence IO and targeted therapies. So what about uh, uh, more recent studies? So one thing about anti-PD-1 is very well tolerated. 
and it served as therefore a backbone for other type of combination regimens. And in 2018 or so, there were something like 1,800 trials going on in cross oncology with PD-1 inhibitors as a backbone. Right now, it's probably double that. Um, and one of the trials that actually turned out to be positive was the uh, Relativity 47 trial, which looked at um, anti-PD-1 nivolumab together with another antibody that blocked another checkpoint, LAG3. And as you can see from this um, slide here, the combination of Nevo plus the LAG3 inhibitor relatlumab or RELA was superior to Nevo monotherapy. And that comparing the um, Nevo IPI to Nevo RELA, both compared to Nevo in these two trials, you can see that for m many of the different subsets, they were um, fairly comparable hazard ratios. Potentially one difference was the BRAF mutant population where the hazard ratio appeared to be better for nevo ipi than nevo rela And so in looking at this other combination, which is now FDA approved, it represents an alternative frontline therapy for patients with metastatic melanoma. The overall activity uh, relative to nevo appears similar to what we see with nevo ipi with about half the toxicity. And it's particularly active in patients with low PDL1 expressing tumors, and the activity doesn't appear to be as strong as Nevo Ipi in the BRAF mutant population, and there's no data left yet available on how it works in the CNS or whether you can stop treatment, although it's um, conceivable that we'll see some activity in those type of studies uh, if they're carried out in the future. And therefore, at least in our practice, we currently favor this approach for our BRAF wild type patients without CNS metastases, particularly if they um, have an assay that shows their PDL1 low. And um, it could be a very useful agent for studying in the adjuvant and neoadjuvant study, and maybe Dr. Bookbinder will talk about that in her talk. Another neoadjuvant approach uh, excuse me, another combination of a LAG3 inhibitor plus an anti-PD-1 is from, rep, um, from Regeneron looking at fianolumab and uh, simiplumab, and you can see a relatively high response rate of 60%, a lot of tumor shrinkage um, in the waterfall plots, and a relatively tolerable regimen. So we'll hear more about this treatment going forward. But not all is rosy in melanoma. Some of our phase three trials that we thought would be great turned out to be dry wells. And that's including um, an IDO inhibitor trial, um, a trial with a novel IL-2 called BEMPEG, and a trial with TBEC, a drug that's actually approved. And so we looked at these trials and wanted to we think that they're, um, this is not good for the field, it's not good for the companies, it's certainly not good for the patients who participated in these trials in comparison to other trials where um, there may have been a more of an advance. And so we looked at some properties related to these trials that failed and tried to sort out for the investigators and potentially for the patients how you would choose um, to go from phase two promising data to phase three. And we broke that down in something we recently published into um, steps, uh, mechanisms of biology, phase one and phase two data, trial design, and um, potential for impact. And we looked and basically we thought that if there was um, single agent activity, um, if there was a, a randomized phase two study that showed that the combination was better than um, the standard of care, or if there was activity in a PD-1 refractory population, particularly if it produced 
a durable benefit, then that was a property that could lead you to go to a phase three trial. And if you didn't have any of those things, then you would need a lot of these other characteristics to be enthusiastic about that phase three trial. So I'm going to close by talking about um, some data with the adjuvant setting. Um, and at least in my view, if um, moving, if we were going to accomplish Vice President Biden, now President Biden's goal of uh, trying to uh, reduce cancer-related mortality by 50% over the next decade, the best way to do that is to give adjuvant or neoadjuvant therapy to all the different tumors where anti-PD-1 show efficacy. We have th um, three different approaches for adjuvant therapy for phase, for stage three patients. The um, um, dibrafenib trametinib that I mentioned previously, uh, pembrolizumab and nivolumab, and all of them have now reported out five-year data which shows about a 50% reduction in relapse-free or distant metastasis-free survival, which is a surrogate for um, preventing disease from coming back. So it's hard to choose between those various therapies. Um, one approach that was recently presented that um, I think was also just published in the New England Journal looked at giving the therapy before surgery. And in some prior studies, the small studies that were compiled by um, uh, a group of individuals involved in the neoadjuvant consortium, you can see that, um, that there was a response rate of about 20% to anti-PD-1 in the neoadjuvant setting in that um, lymph node, in the pathologic CR rate of 21% while Nevo plus Ipi had a pathologic CR rate in the 50 to 60% range. And very few of the patients with either a pathologic um, CR or a major uh, partial response um, actually relapse over time. In contrast, targeted therapy when given in the neoadjuvant setting, those responses were not as durable. So to formally address the question of is um, neoadjuvant therapy better than adjuvant therapy is treating while the, the actual therapy is still in place, which are the lymphocytes that are in your draining lymph node, which are probably enriched for cells that might recognize the tumor, is giving therapy three cycles of Pembro and then before surgery and then 15 cycles after surgery better than just doing surgery and giving 18 cycles of Pembro. And as was reported uh, by Dr. Patel in the New England Journal um, just last week, you can see that the neoadjuvant arm was dramatically better than the same therapy given in the adjuvant setting, 20% difference. So um, I'll just close with some highlighting some other advances in the last year. Um, adjuvant therapy for um, Pembro and Nevo, stage 2B and 3A disease. Maybe Dr. Bookbinder will talk about this. An mRNA vaccine in the adjuvant setting, which also showed some promising data. There was some data in anti-PD-1 resistant disease from SWOG 1616 and some TIL data. And also some data coming out with uh, uh, oncolytic virus from Repimun and some engineered anti-crane T cells and also some data in uveal melanoma. This is a 1616 study data which shows that Nevo IPI is better than IPI in patients who've progressed on single agent anti-PD-1. And this is data on taking those T cells out of the tumor, TIL therapy, um, compared to ipilimumab in patients that have progressed on anti-PD-1 from a Dutch group also recently published. <coughs> and then this interesting molecule, tenbentifus, which is a way to get immune therapy to patients who don't have a lot of the immune cells 
uh, don't have a lot of mutations in their tumor and therefore a lot of immune cells that can target it by sort of creating this molecule that can um, have an antibody recognizing something on melanoma on one end and something that brings T cells to the tumor on the other end. And in a phase three trial in patients with metastatic uveal melanoma, you can see an improvement in overall survival of the blue curve that was even greater than what was seen with uh, progression free survival. So next steps, and you'll hear about this, um, are biomarkers to determine which patients to treat with specific anti-PD-1 regimens, better treatments for checkpoint inhibitor and targeted therapy resistant patients, improving therapies for variant melanoma, and treatment of patients with symptomatic CNS disease, including LMD. And so there's still a lot of research that needs to be done to address these problems. You'll hear from the speakers about some of that research. But I want to close by saying, as we're developing new therapies for melanoma, our goal should not be simply to turn melanoma into a chronic disease. We should be striving to make melanoma a curable disease. And to do that, I think we have some of the tools and some of the past decade um, is making that dream become a reality, but we still have work to do. So this is my team at Georgetown. And uh, these are all the people who I've collaborated with, including my, my funding sources, including the MLA. Thank you very much. Thank you. All right, so I think we have time for two or three quick questions. Yes. Um, Dr. Atkins, um, my name is Colleen Wittosh. I am a stage four metastatic melanoma brain mets only. I was treated at MD Anderson through Jim Allison, Dr. Tavi, and Dr. Amaria. I'm a five-year survivor, scans all clear last week, and that is because of the research that you guys do and that opportunity um, to have that type of uh, phase two clinical trial available for patients. So, yeah, so you, were you on the Checkmate 204 study? Um, I'm not really familiar <laughs> with okay. how you're saying that. Yeah. So um, mine was a phase two clinical trial that just came through when um, Dr. Allison, mm -hmm. that was before 2018. Yeah. Um, that you, so you probably know more on that side yeah. than I do. But it has totally been um, a life-changing experience for so many, not just myself. And what you guys do through that research, watching that, I mean, years ago, I would not have the opportunity to tell you guys. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well, I take it you're one of our thrivers, not just surviving, but thriving and giving back. I'm from the mucosal melanoma gang. Um, fortunately, I've been told it was probably the earliest anybody ever caught it, only because nosebleeds were like canary in the coal mine. Jefferson University did the surgery. I moved the radiation near my house just for convenience. Uh, single lung met a year later, NED 13 years as of close of business Friday. What is the theory on why the rare melanomas and specifically mucosal are so less reactive to what we already have? Yeah, so great question. I think the simplest answer, although it may not be the total answer, is those melanomas, either mucosal melanomas, acromelanomas, or melanomas in the eye, have not driven by sun exposure, they have less passenger mutations in them, and therefore are less recognizable as foreign by the immune system. And for the most part, they also don't have driver mutations in BRAF that can be targeted. Yes, well, the MRA is doing something like that, as you heard, and um, I'm, there, we're trying to do those efforts as well across our melanoma community. 
We have one more question over here. Question, in your presentation in one of your graphs, you had the, um, the list of melanoma and how Ipinevo had worked, those therapies had worked on those specific mutants. Um, question is, you didn't have anything on mucosal melanoma. I'm sorry to bring it up again. Is that because there isn't enough information yet to be able to give that? So the 067 trial that I was talking about mm -hmm. enrolled patients with mucosal melanoma. There have been other trials that have looked at Nevo Ipi in that population, and that tends to be our standard of care for that population because it's the approach that brings new T cells to the tumor as well as activating them. And the activity in the mucosal melanoma population was about half of what it was in the overall population, not zero, not 55% as the overall population, but about 25 to 30%. And many of those responses were durable. It's just, it's not where we want it to be, which is why we're trying to come up with better and therapies. And maybe, as I talked about for uveal melanoma, some of those T cell engagers may be the answer for these tumors that have less um, internal mutations and less immune recognition. And was BRAF the only marker that was used or was CKIT used? Um, I'm not sure what you're asking. Okay. This was immune I'll therapy, not afterwards. targeted therapy. Okay. Uh, Okay, so these patients were getting immune therapy. Okay. All right, so thank you so much, Dr. Atkins, for that great talk. And uh, if you think I was joking about uh, some of this feeling like drinking out of a fire hose, uh, now you know that I was very serious, but it does get easier the more you're here, and uh, we'll continue to build on this foundation. I'd now like to invite my, my friend, uh, who will actually be introducing our next speaker. Uh, Mariah Morris is the Director of Patient Advocacy, uh, our, our, our friend and sponsor, Bristol Myers Squibb. Hi everyone, as Cody said, uh, my name is Mariah Morris. I work in the Patient Advocacy function of Bristol Myers Squibb. And in this position, I've had the true distinct pleasure to partner with the team at Melanoma Research Alliance to really learn a lot more about the unmet needs in the melanoma patient community and really, you know, what matters most to the community. Um, I've been impressed, you know, through the years at the true passion and tenacity that the Melanoma Research Alliance team has you know, not only to advance our understanding of the disease as a whole, but really as being true collaborators across many stakeholders to, you know, advance our understanding of this disease and support patients. So as you've heard from the excellent talk from Dr. Atkins, we've made great progress as a community in the fight against melanoma. But as you all know better than anyone, and as was just mentioned in that last question, there's still you know, so much more work to do in many areas. One of these areas um, where there is the most significant challenge is that of brain metastases and leptomeningeal disease. So to talk about this and present on this topic, I'm really pleased to be able to introduce Dr. Omid Hamid, Dr. Hamid is the director of the Melanoma Center and Phase I Immuno-Oncology Program at the Angelus Clinic and Research Institute, a Cedars-Sinai affiliate. Dr. Hamid is a world-renowned thought leader in melanoma and who is personally involved in clinical trials that help bring four different immunotherapies to market. His work now focuses on developing the next generation of immunotherapies and improving survival for even more patients impacted by melanoma. So it's my honor to introduce you to Dr. Hamid. Well, I'd, I'd like to thank MRA, Cody, and Maya, and um, uh, DMS and others for allowing me to give this talk. A few people know that when I came out of fellowship, I was at USC and uh, was tasked with working in the melanoma clinic and working in the primary brain malignancy clinic. 
And at that time, I, I learned a lot about how to take care of not just primary brain cancers, but brain metastases. But when I would give a talk, it would take forever. I could not find the slides. I could not find the information. And there wasn't much to say about melanoma and brain mets. But I'm fortunate uh, to say that today there's too many slides. There's too much. From what we have gotten from treating um, metastatic melanoma, finding out about mutations, and the next generation therapies, um, we have an armamentarium that is phenomenal and is helping us come to uh, make the right decisions and come to answers. And ultimately, what this has brought forth for us is the ability to go to any pharmaceutical partner and, and show a history of success, of showing that it works in metastatic and then in brain. So for me, it, it's a continuum now. These are my um, uh, disclosures. Uh, when you sit in a room with a patient with melanoma who's newly diagnosed or has been diagnosed with brain metastases or leptomeningeal disease, you try to talk in a very mild fashion, but there's always a big pink elephant in the room. And you sit there calmly and the patient is calm, but it, the outcomes with brain metastases were so poor, weeks, couple months, that you tried to shy away from it, and it became very difficult to find the right answers. And by the end, I'll convince you that this pink elephant is not that difficult to deal with. This is a great um, uh, article in cancer in the late 70s, the autopsy studies, which we don't do enough of, but it showed that you know upon diagnosis, about 40% of patients with melanoma had some brain meds, and autopsy studies showed 75%. And then the leptomeningeal uh, contribution was like 33%. So it's a huge problem. And it's true what Mike Atkins said, that there are patients who even on MRI don't show but may have subclinical brain metastases. So it's important to take care of it. Thankfully, now we have an armamentarium. This is a comparison of pipelines in 2017 versus 2020. And based on our clinical program where we were dying for trials and now we're turning trials away because there's so much and we don't have enough patients, uh, there's it's astronomical growth and all of these can be used for brain metastases. I'll thank Dr. Bookbinder for allowing me to speak before her and apologize for speaking on some things that she will delve into in a greater fashion. I'm just gonna show you that it really works in the brain uh, and targeted therapy, although Dr. Atkins showed you that it works, uh, but th the response is short-lived, can be leveraged for a great benefit in our patients that have uh, metastases inside the brain or leptomeningeal disease, which is metastases to the covering of the brain and the spine. <coughs> this is Combi MD uh, from Mike Davies and others showing that if you give combination of BRAF and MEK inhibitors, you get a response rate that is correlative to what you see in the body. Unfortunately, what you don't see is a similar progression-free survival. The durability of response is almost half. So what do we take from that and what can we do with that is the idea of being able to control significant symptomatic disease that does not allow you to get to immunotherapy, which will give you the long-term benefits. If you can get rapid uh, control, uh, either through surgery or through radiation or even through BRAF inhibitors, you can then transition. And the background to this, and I didn't put this slide in because there's too many slides, comes from data from a good friend of ours, uh, Paulo Asierto, who did a Sagambit study in metastatic melanoma, where you started with BRAF inhibitors for just eight weeks to control disease and then went on to immunotherapy combinations and showed better survivals than if you just put on uh, targeted agents and waited for progression. So this for me is for those patients who harbor a BRAF mutation and are symptomatic, have rapidly growing disease or we need to control before we go to immunotherapy. A short burst is helpful, of course I don't go till 5.6 months because I know there's progression. 
What else you need to know that there are multiple genes mutated in melanoma. There are, I forget the number, 70 to 80 percent of patients harbor something other than BRAF and they are targetable. We know this uh, because we see it work in other solid tumors, whether it's ERB B3 or ALK or um, IDH, uh, HRAS or other mutations, these inhibitors have been shown in other solid tumors to cause tumor regression and to cross the blood-brain barrier. How do I know that? Well, here, this is a pan uh, <coughs> ROS1 and ALK inhibitor and, and trectinib, and this was a clinical trial that took all comers, and this is a patient with melanoma that had response. Now, I'm not saying that this is the answer for everyone, but when you think that you don't have options, every patient that comes to our clinics gets a next generation sequencing and there can be an option. And there are trials. We currently have a trial through ASCO, it's a paper, that gives these targeted agents to other solid tumors that don't have these options and allows patients with, stable, uh, with asymptomatic brain metastases. We're also utilizing information to tell us what we should be doing and where things could be going. And if there are mutations we're missing, circulating tumor DNA is a, a tumor DNA that's shed in your blood. And there are multiple tests that you can get commercially to check for that. You can also look at that in the CSF and there are tests that are coming and trials that are looking at monitoring that, looking for a tumor that has spread from an original area or from a metastasis that may have picked up a mutation we don't know about. And this is being utilized significantly in the neuro-oncology setting. One of the findings that I came across is that dealing with brain metastasis used to be the job of the neuro-oncologist, someone who was either trained in oncology, neurology, or even pediatrics, and became a neuro-oncologist, and we sent our patients there. And this information was sort of miscommunicated or lost, but all oncologists now are neuro-oncologists and can treat patients. What about checkpoint inhibitor therapy? Uh, this is the data with anti-CTLA-4 and anti-PD-1 and also the BRAF, uh, and the BRAF and MET. But what you're seeing here, and this is checkmate 204, and I was telling Dr. Bookbinder that for all patients, I'm gonna put a registry and I'm gonna name these studies and they're not gonna be like checkmates. I'm gonna give them names that we know what they are. Like, I was on the Sparkle study or whatever, but this study, so that we can all communicate appropriately, this study was wonderful. Why? Because it kept patients coming to my clinic. And we have patients here that showed about a 55% response rate, and that response was durable. How do I know that? It's the tail of the curve. And Checkmate 204, upper right corner, you see that tail of the curve? It continues, and I have patients five or nearly 10 years out. So. The backbone of an immunotherapy with a PD-1 or PD-1 CTLA-4 is important here. And we're building, there's the tail of the curve, we're building other combinations. As we speak in our clinics, we have triplet. I said here it's a quadruplet. It's the anti-LAG-3, which is relatlimab, anti-PD-1, which is nivolumab, anti-CTLA-4, ipilimumab, plus an IL-6 inhibitor in non-brain mets, but if it works well, we see low toxicity, guess what, there's gonna be a brain met study coming. And we're also, this is uh, leptomeningeal disease data that comes from Ryan Sullivan, all of you know Ryan, he's a MRA investigator, but we're also looking at genomic and transcriptome correlates of immunotherapy response within the microenvironment, looking at CSF and uh, tumor tissue from resection. What about radiation? This is my only radiation slide. I'm so happy to say that we've moved away from whole brain radiation because immunotherapy and targeted therapy can control disease. I never begin by telling anyone to go to whole brain radiation. We use spot welding with what you call just a gamma knife radiation or SRS or SBRT, they all mean the same. But this was an interesting study that came out it's a randomized phase two trial of proton craniospinal irradiation. So the brain and the spine for the hardest uh, melanoma to treat, leptomeningeal disease, but this was melanoma, lung cancer, and breast cancer versus just spot welding those areas in the leptomeninges. 
and there was a better overall survival that was significant in lung and breast, and we're looking forward to the other solid tumor data. We're also improving on the immunotherapy, and we're improving on PD-1 and CTLA-4. We're trying to find drugs that work better, that bind better, that you can dose higher with less toxicity, and this is a bispecific antibody, uh, Medi-5752, that needs a different name, Unicorn or something, but this was a bispecific antibody that we found binds better, faster to CTLA-4, and binds less to other target cells, so less toxicity. And there is no reason that these things cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, uh, and we're gonna find that out. And this is a trial written by Adil Daoud, who's at UCSF. Adil runs a great program, and we're fortunate to collaborate with him. But what's interesting here is that, you know, not one, not two, not three, but four. Four drugs, two bispecific, CTLA-4, LAG-3, uh, PD-1 and ICOS, but four checkpoints together. It's looking at metastatic melanoma and looking at brain uh, disease. So we'll look into that. Uh, one of the targets we don't talk about is uh, VEGF, antivascular agents that are big in other cancers, Avastin you might have heard of and others. And these are very helpful in the central nervous system. I put this slide up because this is a uh, VEGF targeted agent that has a compendium approval uh, for second line melanoma, lenvatinib. And lenvatinib and uh, Keytruda here, or pembrolizumab, it's approved for other solid, uh, solid tumors. It's uh, endometrial cancer, it's approved. And lenvatinib has shown great responses in melanoma that's heavily pretreated with checkpoint and other therapies and is now finished the randomized phase three in the first line and hopefully it'll be at the earlier part of Dr. Atkins' talk next year, not at the end of Dr. Atkins' talk. But uh, these agents help because they decrease the swelling from tumors. They decrease the shift of brain metastases. They allow for immunotherapy to work, and blocking VEGF can uh, boost immunotherapy. We know that high VEGF levels are a poor prognosis. They affect dendritic cell function and immune function, et cetera. What else? Well, how about directly given therapy into uh, the, the brain into the CSF. Uh, this is Isabella Glitza, who is a great friend and works at MD Anderson. She's my friend at MD Anderson Cancer Center. Everyone references Hussein Talby these days. But Dr. Glitza has done a, an amazing trial of looking at intrafecal nivolumab. We know that giving these drugs in small units directly into tumor works. There have been trials of directly injecting PD-1, directly injecting MTCTLA-4 into tumors that are in lymph nodes or skin, and there's been response. Why not directly into the central nervous system, into the CSF? Uh, Dr. Glitza has informed me that she has completed this trial, and there'll be a publication coming soon, but they've seen responses and durable responses for many, many weeks and months in patients who would, you would have lost within you know, four to six weeks. And this is a great slide uh, because if you follow it on the left-hand side, I gotta do like this. If you follow it on the left-hand side, this patient had everything. Radiation, temidar, ipilimumab, nivolumab, blah, 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 uh, and failed it, and then went on to just uh, uh, giving uh, intrathecal nivolumab and has 50 cycles. Look at the dates down there, 6 2018 to 4 2020. And I'm not moved by this. It's the same slides that Jed Wolchuk showed with, with metastatic disease outside of the central nervous system. So we knew these drugs could work, and we know that there's evidence that they can cross the blood brain barrier. There's evidence that we can give it directly into the brain. I'm just going to transition now into cellular therapies because these are all the rage now in melanoma. CAR-T, adoptive T-cell therapy, bispecific, the MTAX that um, like Tabentafus, and I'm just gonna hit on them a little bit. But there are so many new trials and new therapies, so there can never be a patient with melanoma that says there isn't a trial that's appropriate 
So adoptive T cell therapy quickly, you get the tumor, you take it out, you tumor digest it, you find the T cells that are specific for the tumor, and you grow them, that's called the rapid expansion, and you put them in a bag. Before it used to only happen in a couple of areas, and now there are trials where they do it centrally, and they send it back to you and you give it. How do I know? Because I work in a small clinic. Um, academics call me a private practice doc. Private practice docs call me an academic, but I would tell you that I'm a hybrid, and that's where a lot of regional, local regional care should go into academic private hybrid docs. But we gave this, and we were good contributors to the uh, IOVANS trial. So the patient comes in, gets a chemotherapeutic regimen, not targeted at the tumor, but to get rid of the other T cells. You give them their single infusion of their billions of tills, and then you give some IL-2 to aggravate their immune system. So IL-2 still has a, a big place in melanoma. And what have we seen? This is John Hannon's data of second line post PD-1 with higher response rates to till therapy than giving anti-CCLA-4 therapy and a better survival. And this was in the New England Journal of Medicine, so you know it's true. <laughs> and this is the IOVANS data that was presented where it, it was throughout the nation. It was a uh, blend of, tri of trial uh, sites that were in the community, that were in academic centers. And what I want to bring your attention to is there were responses, there were early responses, those blue diamonds are patients who had an initial response and you can see they happened very early. They were durable, some people went from stable disease to partial response, some people went to, from partial response to having everything clear out and the durability was great. But if you look at that big red square around there, the majority of patients who were on this trial and the majority of patients who responded their best response to in, uh, checkpoint therapy was progressive disease. So we're finding therapies that work when our standards don't work, when our checkpoints don't work, and they were durable. And you see a very robust survival, and 80% of patients had seen CTLA-4. Uh, the patients who had BRAF mutations had already seen BRAF therapy, uh, et cetera. But I bring you to this. Uh, and that there is some data presented from, uh, <coughs> sorry, uh, in the NIH, Steve Rosenberg's data and others where patients with brain metastases showed response, brain metastases showing response. And currently this is Allison Betov Warner who was at Memorial and has just started at Stanford. She works with Susan Sweater who's a big MRA uh, investigator, so Dr. Betoff Warner is now running a trial in patients with brain metastases looking for adoptive T cell therapy. And this is the real deal. These are first line uh, patients who are being treated with combination of PD-1 and TIL, and it looks good. These are waterfall plots. Um, I always have to reorient myself. Going down, those lines going down is good, and you see a lot of it going down. And you find the one tenant of what I say to any oncologist, that the data that we are deriving for our patients in melanoma are important not just for our patients for melanoma. You're not advocating for a small group of patients. When we published the Keytruda data, it was in melanoma and lung cancer. And now as I stand here, I can't even think about the number of solid tumors where anti-PD-1 has a first line indication, gastric, esophageal, Merkel, cutaneous, lung, renal, you know, gyn, et cetera. So we're finding that head and neck, it works for head and neck, cervical. So these therapies are gonna revolutionize how we take care of patients, not just uh, with melanoma, but hard to treat patients and uh, uh, tumors that are a global issue, like cervical cancer, a global issue. All right, what about CAR T therapy? This one doesn't require surgery. You take the, uh, you ferrise the T cells out, you add a homing mechanism, like an antibody, and you target something. Uh, this is Dr. Kalbasi, who's running a trial, looking at a specific target in melanoma, allowing brain mets. Um, and this trial, I believe, is 
fully accrued or nearly accrued. But why do I say that? Because you can learn a lot by going to other meetings. And this is stuff from Stanford, you know, giving a lot of uh, shout outs to Stanford. But this was a phase one trial for the feasibility and safety of CAR T cells. And the CAR T was given in two ways. These are for low grade gliomas. They were given uh, traditionally IV, just admit the patient, you give CAR T IV like we do for B cell, ALL and others where it's standard, you give it IV. But it had an arm that looked at, if you look at the bottom, the optional ICV. So that's uh, giving it intracerebral through an Amaya reservoir. And what did they see there? This is hard to get, but you see these, um, the darker orange. Uh, when you gave those CAR T's through in directly into the central nervous system, you saw less toxicity, you saw more activation, and they showed me this, which was amazing. <laughs> uh, a near complete response, seven infusions, response durable 11 months. That's cuckoo crazy, lovely stuff. And there's no reason that this can't be done in melanoma or other solid tumors. NK cell therapies, it's just suffice it to know that NK cells are other types of immune cells. They're not T cells or B cells, but they're other immune cells in your body. The great thing about NK cells is that you can give them to anyone. <laughs> they're not very, you don't really mount an, an attack against it. And NK cells can be grown to a point where they can be given uh, hundreds or thousands of infusions from just one donor. NK cells can be given from, your, from the patient to themselves, an auto NK, and they can be given allo NK. Allo NK is from someone else. And the newer therapies with NK cells allow, uh, uh, don't need pre-medication. Uh, pre pre they don't need a preconditioning regimen with chemotherapy. They don't need hospitalization. They don't need an adjuvant like high dose IL-2. You could give it in the clinic. And that's amazing. You don't, the patient can come, show up in your clinic and be signed up to get this therapy right away. There's no harvest, nothing, off the shelf, ready to go. And this is amazing, uh, amazing work that's being done by multiple people and being done, oh, let me go back, sorry being done by some of my favorite people. This is uh, SNK, uh, uh, this is their data. I believe this was lung cancer with auto NK, but in patients that were pd one negative, that were unresponsive to uh, uh, PD-1 therapy, uh, and they've shown responses in lung cancer and sarcoma. Talk about an immune desert, something that doesn't respond, that's sarcoma and we're seeing NK cells work well. Um, I didn't, I did put a slide, I did. There are multiple trials going up on in this. Here's one of systemic NK cells and temozolomide for stage four melanoma metastatic to the brain. So it's coming and it's already here. Um, these bispecifics that are approved for ocular melanoma, I just wanna make a point, I call them a matchmaker or Orienta antibodies, two sides. One clamps onto the T cell, one clamps onto the tumor, brings them together and says you two should meet. And it's a very bad relationship. The T cell kills the tumor. It works well, it's a homing mechanism and we think it's, it's great for those patients who can't get the T cells to the tumor and there are trials looking at this with PD-1 in multiple solid tumors. We know that it traffics the lymphocyte into the tumor, pre-treatment, post-treatment. Um, and this is one that targets a prime and not the one that targets GP100. You don't need to know that. But this was data that came from uh, MD Anderson and that's based on work from uh, Dr. Nieto and my favorite Persian doctor, which is Kathy Levani. They're just taking NK cells from um, cord blood and they're growing it up. And they're also adding, they're weaponizing it by adding a bispecific that binds to the NK cell and takes it directly to the tumor. And there's no reason that this can't be given. All right, so as I come to the end of my talk, <coughs> a couple points to be made here. You need a multidisciplinary team. 
And it just doesn't have to be in one place. I have privileges at three separate hospitals and work with their radiation oncologists, the neurosurgeons who need to come in at times to help us get the patient through therapy or get them to the next therapy. Uh, there needs to be a patient advocate, a social worker, a palliative care person, a nurse practitioner, et cetera. Uh, so this is the multidisciplinary team, but I love this because it reminds me of Howard Shear. And Howard Shear, none of you know because he takes care of prostate cancer, but he's at Memorial. And I went to, I used to, I went to the Prostate Cancer Foundation to talk about anti-CTLA-4 a long, long time ago, and he talked about not thinking about it as the elephant in the room. You have to think about it like there's a stallion in the room, that you have to grab this and ride it to success. And that's the, the way that I think of my patients when they come in. There's no reason why they cannot benefit like the lovely patient here who was on the Sparkle study that asked the question. And so I think conclusions improve survival for patients, many new pathways, many new agents. Uh, the second line and is expanding as we're improving the first line, as we're adding more in, because that's a paradigm for all solid chemos. Breast cancer, you treat with three, ke three chemos and go on. Why not treat with so much more in melanoma? There are options for brain metastasis. And of course, why we're always here, clinical trials, clinical trials, clinical trials, clinical trials. An invitation if you're in LA to come visit us. And uh, thank you for your time. And we'll take questions. Right. Uh, so we do have time for some questions. If anyone wants to raise their hand. Hello, Dr. Hamid, my favorite doctor in LA. <laughs> he does happen to be a doctor of mine. Um, I just wanted to go back to one of your initial slides, the publication, I think, from the 1970s yeah. that showed such a difference between the sort of autopsies of um, brains of patients with cancer showing disease versus what had actually been diagnosed. That's quite a scary thing for me personally to think that maybe my MRIs are not picking up everything that could be um, lurking there. Um, you know, so, so what, how do we solve for that? Is it through higher resolution imaging? Is it through AI interpretation of those images? Um, is it better therapeutics? I just like your thoughts on that. Yeah, so I think it's all of that. The good answer is all of that. Number one, I'm gonna call all the other doctors that are in the chair and let, let them know that you said I'm your favorite, <laughs> number one. Number two, one thing to know is uh, what we've shown is what's happening here is what's happening everywhere. So if you see things go away, you know that that's working in other areas. We know this, this is why you get meningitis. There's an immune system in specific to your central nervous system. That's number one. Number two, uh, I have a lot of favorite Howards. Another favorite Howard of mine is Howard Sewell, who works at uh, the Milken Institute, which is intimately involved with MRA. But um, he's told me that there are coming our eight Tesla MRIs, so better uh, MRI that can pick up even Lewy bodies, early Alzheimer's, stuff like that. So radi radiation uh, radiologists, are improving their field. Radiation is improving. Um, one of the other things uh, that I would say to you is the way that we take care of brain mess is improving. I didn't put a slide up there. And it melds into a couple things that Mike Ashton says. Neoadjuvant therapy is not just for local therapy. It's for therapy anywhere. Uh, but with the local therapy, you can find predictors to response. Uh, prognosticators for uh, outcome, and you can utilize that to pick the right therapy in the first line for our patients. So those have taken the place of autopsy studies. We want tissue to know what happens, how we change the microenvironment, what works and what, what doesn't. We wanna find, I always used to talk about exceptional responders. 
why was that person such an exceptional responder? We never could do that. And now through neoadjuvant studies where you give the therapy, you pull out the tissue and you see, oh my God, it's all gone. It's, there's something on the x-ray, but it's all dead. You know, you're familiar with that paradigm. And we can then go to the patient and figure out why. Why did this group of patients do well? And then we can examine them head to toe. What color hair did they have? Where did they come from? What are their genomics? What do they like to eat? Blah, 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 blah. And then hopefully utilize that to give you the peace of mind that you need. There was data in recurrent glioblastoma. So I didn't mention glioblastoma. Recurrent glioblastoma. If you gave a couple of cycles of PD-1 therapy and then did the surgery versus just doing the surgery and giving whatever, it's better outcomes. So I believe that the neoadjuvant uh, paradigm is here to stay for multiple solid tumors and we've gone heavy into opening those trials. Awesome. We have another question over here. Was there a question over here? Uh, thank you, Dr. Hameen. Um, I made sure to let Dr. Tabi know that you gave him a shout out here, which is fine. <laughs> um, my question is, you know, you talked about some of these combination of therapies with the brain, but um, do you find that starting treatment and then doing cyber knife radiation has a better result, or is it usually the other way around? Right, so I, we don't have that quite that answer. What I have found is that in patients who have asymptomatic brain metastases, specifically because uh, the SPARKLE trial, 204, didn't allow radiation, that I found that patients who got treated after a couple of cycles and you looked in and they were responding never really needed radiation so that we can avoid that toxicity. We've also found that radiation can act as a to release tumor antigen and may help immunotherapy work better, right? And we've also, one of the things that you need to, why we have multidisciplinary teams, because you can tell the radiation oncologist, it's very safe to give radiation with immunotherapy. It's not so safe to give it with targeted therapy. Uh, so for me, it's helped us to know when and how to utilize it and how to avoid toxicity because Quality of life is important also. And uh, there are two misconceptions. One is that melanoma is not uh, radiation sensitive. It is, we've seen it. And the second is that radiation is non-toxic. It isn't, I've seen it. So it, it's helping us to be able to shape a therapeutic paradigm, and this is another thing, bespoke for the patient, like a suit, bespoke, that utilizes each of our uh, tools at the right time. Okay. I have a question, and this is not something you have specifically addressed, but uh, someone mentioned earlier that a lot of the cutaneous melanomas are caused by sun exposure. Where do they come from in people who are not outdoorsy, that don't spend any time outside? Cutaneous melanomas? Mm -hmm. uh, mutate I can't answer pediatric. Okay, this I mean, is not, maybe genetic this is, predisposition. Yeah. Um, uh, I will say we're making inroads there. Most of the trials now are allowing younger patients and they're showing the same responses and safety. Uh, and the others, I would say that there are, I don't have the greatest answer for you, but mutations from other events. All right, I think we have time for one more question, if anyone, I see Jamie. Would that be like epigenetic therapy involved? Yeah, because we know epigenetic therapy, like uh, methylating, uh, methylation therapy has some responses in it, and that's work that comes to mind when we talk about like Ryan Sullivan and some of that work. Sorry, uh, so my question is, you mentioned, um, using cord blood in one of the NK uh, stem, cell, stem cells. Was that, I'm just interested to know, was that cord blood use, was it in any way related to the patient who got it? Or it was not just- Not related to the not patient related. who okay. got it. Yeah, it's great. The best part and the worst part of 
medicine is finding amazing therapies that just blow your mind and give you the, the energy to move on and to, to know that there's more out there and more to offer. That's also the worst part because you realize you're not doing that amazing work. And so you get on the phone with Bella Glitza and Kathy Rizvani and say, I'd like to start an intrafecal NK trial for melanoma. And they say, oh yeah, we're doing this in other solid tumors, why not melanoma? And that trial is coming. All right, I've taken too much time. Thank you, Dr. Hamid, for a great talk. <laughs> Over the last decade, 15 new therapeutic approaches have earned FDA approval. There are currently over 500 clinical trials that are actively enrolling patients with melanoma. Uh, this is great news. Uh, our, uh, our progress, our momentum has never been better than it is now, but it also can be really overwhelming for patients, families, and even doctors alike. Uh, we are very fortunate to have Dr. Beth Buckbinder from Dana-Farber Cancer Institute to walk us through some of these exciting clinical trials and, and to highlight some of the emerging therapies that we should all be looking for. Dr. Buckbinder is a clinical oncologist at Dana-Farber Cancer Institute who specializes in the treatment of melanoma. She also performs clinical and translational research to help further melanoma treatment. Her research interests include immunotherapy, targeted therapy, and early drug development. all so much for having me. I did not realize how impossible it was going to be talking after Dr. Atkins and Dr. Hamid. So many of these slides may look familiar, but they say that repetition is the best way to learn. So we will uh, cover a couple areas again. But I wanted to start, if I talked about all of the trials I'm excited about in melanoma, all of the new therapies that I'm excited about in melanoma, we probably would miss the reception because there is so much going on in this space right now. It is a really exciting area. We've had so much that has been new over the last, since 2011, so many new therapies. So what I decided I wanted to do is focus in on some of the big changes that we've had in the melanoma space over the last year or two, what those changes are doing to our therapy and what big questions remain and kind of what to keep an ear out for over the next year or two. And I'll try and touch on expanding a little, but definitely um, focusing kind of on some of the main concepts. And we can definitely talk more at the reception, at other places. I'm glad you're gonna hear a lot of science over the next couple of days, so. So I wanted to first break down kind of the different areas of melanoma. And in this, I focused really on the different stages uh, less the different subtypes. So mucosal melanoma, uveal melanoma is kind of a separate. I'll try and address these as we go through some of these different st uh, stages of melanoma. So I'm going to start at the beginning. So we've really had some big trials recently that have impacted treating melanoma earlier and earlier in the course of disease. So working harder to prevent it from coming back as opposed to treating it once it has. And so the big area of change over the last couple of years has been in stage two melanoma. Um, and with stage two melanoma, it's looking at, it's the new addition of treatment with PD-1 inhibition in this space. And what has really become clear with some of these trials is that we need to be better at picking which patients to treat. So a lot of these drugs, PD-1 inhibitors, have toxicities associated with, associated with them. Even though PD-1 inhibitors are generally better tolerated, you still have patients who develop things like diabetes, um, issues with diarrhea, adrenal insufficiency, long-term problems because of the therapy. And so picking which patients really need this is important. And so first I wanna talk about the trials that have really brought therapy into melanoma. So this is kind of the most important prognostic factor in early stage melanoma, and that is Breslow depth. So how deep has this melanoma grown? How much access has it gotten of, to lymphatics, to blood vessels, to nerves, to other things? And what 
does that mean for it potentially hiding, spreading, coming back later? And so Breslow depth, the, as it gets deeper, we get higher and higher stage from stage one, really thin melanomas, to stage two, thicker melanomas. And so trials have shown now that treating patients with thicker melanomas with PD-1 in the preventative space can lead, lower the risk of recurrence. And so this is recurrence-free survival. This is for PEMBRO versus placebo. This is for NEVO versus placebo. So both of these drugs have benefit in, term, in, the, in the stage two space, preventing recurrence. But they also have toxicities. And so what we really need to do is figure out which stage two patients to treat. And this is an area where there's a lot of work and a lot of effort in terms of research. And there's a couple things. So I mentioned the Breslow depth. We don't really, when we think about treating patients with these therapies, the patients on trial had thicker stage two melanomas, the two Bs, two Cs. And so we really do think about those thicker ones, those two Cs, those patients with the higher risk where it's worth it to risk the toxicity. But also there's a lot of work looking at new biomarkers, things that may predict who's gonna do worse than other people. I mentioned one here, which patients are gonna do worse, which is circulating tumor DNA. And so as a patient, you may be hearing about this. This is in the news a lot with other cancers. It's used a lot in some lung cancers and other tumors. And I think it's something that we're gonna be hearing more and more about and that your doctors will be talking to you about and potentially even testing to see if they can detect tumor even earlier than scans do. And so what is circulating tumor DNA? So when tumor cells die, or sometimes even when they're still living, they can secrete pieces of DNA that get into the bloodstream. And there are different tests to detect these little pieces of DNA that are out in the bloodstream so that they can figure out if, may, if there's tumor that can't be seen on a scan. And some of the tests, they actually take a piece of tumor, sequence it, and base this test on the, the genetics of that specific tumor. Others are more broad and do this testing without actually testing the tumor. But these types of tests are the kind of things that are going to be being used more and more and tested more and more and are going to be part of clinical trials, both that are testing new drugs and then also are going to be part of tests on their own, figuring out how to guide therapy, how these tests can potentially be used to figure out who needs more therapy, who doesn't, who can be done and we just watch them, or who needs additional treatment or a closer monitoring or something else of that type. Other biomarkers, other tests are also under development. Um, in uveal melanoma, we have the CASEL test. There are, there are other different tests that are under development that you will be hearing about. And there's going to be a lot of work in this area trying to better predict whose tumor is at highest risk of coming back. Right now, good old pathology is still one of our best markers of that and that Breslau thickness. But over time, we may get more and more answers here. So this is an area that I think there'll be a lot of exciting work in and, and a space to watch in melanoma. So the next area where um, we think about a lot is in stage three melanoma. So these are melanomas that have gone to the lymph node. We know that in stage three melanoma, we heard from Dr. Atkins that we've got adjuvant immunotherapy with PD-1 inhibition. We've got adjuvant targeted therapy that could be considered for these patients. But what is really going on in this space is newer and newer combinations. So we've already heard about relatlamab, which is the LAG3 inhibitor, and this is being tested in the adjuvant space. But one thing that's really, really been hitting the news recently that all of us have probably heard about or had someone ask us about is the question of vaccines in melanoma and what, what's going on in this space and, and what should we be keeping an eye out for? So I'm gonna back up for a second and talk about neoantigens. So neoantigens are what are being targeted by a lot of these newer vaccines. And what they are is when your immune system is attacking a virus or attacking a bacteria, it is attacking some protein on the surface of that bug, of that bacteria, that virus, that's an antigen. 
that antigen is something that's not seen anywhere else in the body, which is why the immune system knows to attack that. Vaccines that have been tried in the past for tumors are generally trying to target something about that melanoma cell that is general to melanoma, but that often is elsewhere in the body as well. When a tumor develops and there are genetic changes within that tumor, then new proteins are made. New things are made that are not anywhere else but on that tumor. And that's what the immune system can recognize, and those are neoantigens. And so the opportunity with targeting neoantigens is that they're specific to the tumor. They're not elsewhere in the body, so you're not going to have an immune reaction against somewhere else in the body. Um, and so that it can be a lot more targeted, a lot more specific, and as a result, potentially even work better, really target that immune system in. And so this is an area that's been really active. These are some slides from a colleague of mine, Dr. Ott, who has been working to develop a vaccine based on this concept. Um, this is what's called a peptide vaccine. So what they do is they figure out what neoantigens are on a melanoma in a specific patient, make little pieces of protein, give patients those little pieces of protein as a vaccine so that the immune system mounts a response against that. And as a result, then the immune system hopefully will work more against that cancer in combination with immune checkpoint inhibitors and other, other agents. And um, this is some of the data so far for this, some of the clinical responses. And you can see, we, we heard earlier about waterfall plots. Anything below the line is good. That's a patient whose disease is shrinking. Um, in this case, this vaccine was tested in melanoma, non-small cell, bladder cancer. You can see quite effective in melanoma in terms of um, that, some clinical responses. Um, but what you're really hearing about now probably is this, the mRNA vaccine. So COVID really opened up mRNA vaccines in terms of all of us hearing about these in the news all the time. But what are mRNA vaccines? So instead of giving a little piece of protein, you give RNA that causes the cells to create that protein so that then the immune system can react against it and build an immune response. And so the idea here is that potentially by doing mRNA both, it causes that pro peptide or protein to be produced, but then also it's causing it in the cell, so the cell's presenting it, so that may even bring about more of an immune response. And so we, what has been very exciting that unfortunately we, I don't have data yet to show you other than the press release, and, and it'll be presented in, uh, in April, uh, is this Moderna and Merck mRNA 4157 V940, which is a trial of patients with stage three and four melanoma who were treated with pembrolizumab in combination with an mRNA vaccine versus pembrolizumab alone. And in the press release, it reduced the risk of recurrence or death by 44%. But we will see that data soon and be able to kind of dig into it and see what that really means. But very exciting for our field in terms of seeing the potential for use of a vaccine in the preventative space. Um, and this was a vaccine that was take where patients' tumors were taken, the vaccine was built based upon neoantigens in that tumor, and an mRNA vaccine was given back. So this is very exciting stuff, and an area really to keep an eye on, because it's going to be super exciting to see what happens here. So these are trials to definitely watch for, and that we may be seeing uh, FDA approval, or who knows, in the near future. So what's next? So we heard about neo uh, sorry, neoadjuvant therapy. I've been talking about neoantigen so much, I can't reset my mind here. Um, so neoadjuvant therapy is treatment for patients with borderline resectable or resectable tumors even before they're removed. And what uh, has been shown is that doing this and giving therapy before surgery and continuing it after surgery is better than starting with surgery. And I'll show that data real quick, although I know it was shown before. Um, 
But there's a lot of questions in this space. What treatment is really best in the neoadjuvant space? Is it just, we've, we've got data for pembrolizumab for PD-1 alone, should we be doing combinations? Should we be doing ipinevo? Should we be doing nevorolatlimab? Should we be doing targeted therapy? Should we be doing triplets? And then also, what do we do with the information? The neoadjuvant setting provides us a huge opportunity to look at what happens after this treatment's given. And so this was the study we saw before, SWOG1801. Patients either got PEMRO for three cycles, surgery, and then more PEMRO, or went right to surgery and then got PEMRO. And the end point here is a really interesting one. So it's event-free survival. So this was designed to really look at all sorts of different factors. So did patients have their melanoma come back? Were they able to get to surgery? Were they able to get to the neoadjuvant, the, the adjuvant therapy portion? You know, did stuff go wrong along the way so that you're not just looking at, at the end whether stuff went wrong, but were there, were there reasons they didn't do well? And that's why it's called event-free survival. And what was seen was that this neoadjuvant arm really did better. And as a result, most of us are now giving neoadjuvant therapy when we can in clinic. But a lot of questions remain, and there's a lot that we still have to figure out. And so how do we best give it? What decisions you know, can we take from resection results? So at the top, I've got two uh, melanomas that have been resected. On the left, what you can see is just black, dead, pigment, nothing. Bunch of necrosis, bunch of, um, there are actually a bunch of immune cells in there that are eating up that pigment and digesting all those melanoma cells. On the right is a nice, healthy-looking melanoma that really kind of survived despite the immunotherapy. And so when you see this, it obviously tells you whether the therapy is working or not. So how do we, what do we do with that? Do we then give those patients who have a great response less therapy? Do we give those patients who had a terrible response more therapy? Do we switch drugs? And this is something we really need to tease out and figure out. How do we use what we can gain from doing neoadjuvant therapy and turn it into a benefit to patients and, and really improve long-term how patients do? This Prado study that is in the bottom left is a, is a very interesting study that was presented a couple years ago, actually, looking at that exact question. So they took the path from patients after neoadjuvant therapy and looked at, well, if they had a complete response, can we not give them more therapy, do less surgery? Um, if they only had a partial response somewhere in the middle, and if they really didn't respond, then definitely do more surgery, give more therapy, potentially even change therapy. Um, Studies like this, this one uh, was small, but studies like this are, I think, where we're going to be going, and we're going to be seeing more studies looking at this, in addition to more studies looking at combinations in the neoadjuvant setting and other things. Um, and then finally, what can we do with biomarkers in this space? So I mentioned the circulating tumor DNA in our stage 2 patients. I think that's something that also can be used here in terms of looking at after therapy, what we see with if patients get, have tumor when they're started on neoadjuvant therapy and we can detect circulating tumor DNA, that could be a marker we can follow going forward. So there's just a lot to do here and a lot that we still need to figure out. So what about patients with metastatic melanoma? Um, where are we going in this space? We heard already about... Um, that most of our patients are starting on combination based on the DreamSeq trial, that immunotherapy is really the place to start. Right now, we've got Ipinevo, we've got Nevorella. How do we pick which patients to start on which? We've got some guidance with the BRAF mutation, high LDH, brain mets, those sorts of things. Um, but where do we go? How do we elevate those responses? How do we work to control toxicity since that's becoming a bigger and bigger issue? We're hearing about trials potentially combining four agents, combining Ipi, Nevo, Rella, and potentially um, an IL-6 inhibitor, but looking at adding more and more drugs. Um, so what is that going to mean in terms of where we go and what we do? And so um, this is just the data on relatlimab, which you've seen already. 
which has kind of complicated that frontline discussion with patients. Um, this is actually some old data looking at GMCSF in combination with ipilimumab, and what was seen was that it improved overall survival without improving progression-free survival, um, and it was seen that toxicity was much lower with this. And so there's actually an ECOG trial currently going on that's looking at the combination of ipinevo with or without GMCSF, looking at can we keep the, tox the efficacy of ipinevo but lower that toxicity, have less diarrhea, less terrible side effects, less problems by adding in a third drug that might actually not so much focus on improving how the therapy works but might focus on getting rid of some of those side effects and making the therapy more manageable. And so in addition to this agent, there's also work, and I mentioned this already with uh, tocilizumab and also with other IL-6 inhibitors. So these are drugs that are often used to treat side effects from immunotherapy. They're used a lot in CAR T cells. Um, so when patients get really bad cytokine release syndrome and, and get very, very sick from CAR T cells, these drugs are used. And so there's effort looking at combining these with ipinevo, and then as mentioned previously, combining this with ipinevo rela, so in a quad study. So these are areas of really, um, I think active and exciting work in the frontline setting in terms of not just looking at adding more drugs for efficacy, but really thinking about we've got some effective agents. How can we make these agents more tolerable, have people have less side effects? Because that's not just important in the frontline. It's very hard to put a patient on a second line immunotherapy trial if they've had severe colitis from ipinevo in the first line. So the result is that if you have patients with bad side effects, they're not necessarily eligible for a trial later on, and so you really, really want to, getting these under control and avoiding side effects is a big priority right now in the frontline metastatic space. So next, um, what about later line metastatic? And this is where some of what I'm going to talk about is really going to overlap a lot with what you've heard already. Um, one area that is kind of being figured out is as we get more options, where do we start? Do we start with ipinevo? Do we start with nevorella? Does nevorella work as well after ipinevo? Does ipinevo work as well after nevorella? If you start someone on PD-1 alone, where do you go? We've got some data that was mentioned from S16016, which was a trial looking at ipi versus ipinevo after PD-1, showing that ipinevo was better. But Beyond that, there's still a lot that we need to figure out in terms of as we get more drugs, how do we combine them? How do we sequence them? How do we order them? In terms of exciting therapies that likely we'll be hearing about in this space and that you've heard about already today, so one of the big ones is TIL therapy. Um, so once again, taking advantage of the T cells that are already there in the melanoma, taking them out, growing them up, giving them back to patients with some chemo and some IL-2. Um, pretty complicated therapy, requires inpatient admission, so not an easy thing to do. But on the other hand, what we're seeing is these nice responses and in patients that had received other drugs previously. And so in addition, in patients previously on PD-1, this was also uh, shown by Dr. Amid and Dr. Atkins. This is comparing TIL therapy versus IPI in patients that got PD-1 alone up front. Now, obviously we're talking about giving most patients combination up front, but that really does show that this may be a very good second line option in terms of things to consider. Now, I really love this slide at SITSI, and I'm going to explain it because I think it's both pretty looking, and it shows that the patients on this trial were not patients that, you know, kind of had one line of therapy and then went on to TILS. So what this is, is it's every line of therapy that these patients had. So if you kind of track out, there's a patient there who had 10 prior therapies before going on TILS. And so it shows that, that, you know, this is a therapy that potentially can even work after many, many different lines of therapy. 
including chemotherapy, different targeted therapies, uh, triplets, and other things. And so this shows that a lot of the patients were very heavily pretreated uh, in on the TIL therapy trials. In addition, TIL therapy was generally pretty well tolerated. Most of the side effects occur when patients are in the hospital. And I'm going to give that pretty well tolerated. Obviously, patients can get pretty sick when they're in the hospital, getting IL-2, getting this chemotherapy that wipes out all their um, immune cells and other things, um, but that that toxicity doesn't continue. And so, so this is a therapy we're all very excited about, and that the responses were durable so that the responses were long-lasting, so that TIL therapy continued. Um, we've seen this image a couple times today. So in uveal melanoma, uh, we've had the approval of tibentifus for IMCGP100. So what this is is a bispecific molecule. It pulls the T cell into the uveal melanoma, targeting GP100, but GP100 is also expressed on cutaneous melanoma cells, and so this is something that is in active research in cutaneous melanoma as well. In addition, there are other targets beyond GP100 that are being examined, such as PRAIM, which is another potential area of uh, another target that's going to be explored. And so this is another um, area of exploration that is an area to watch and to um, that, that we may be seeing some exciting things on, but that there's some pretty active trials on. Um, this is the data for tibentifus benuvial melanoma, but we'll see where this goes in terms of cutaneous melanoma as well. And then there are many, many areas of immunotherapy under development and under exploration, and a bunch that I didn't mention, but that there, there are really active clinical trials. So one example of these are the oncolytic viral therapies or the injection therapies into tumors. Um, there are many of these under development with many different targets, mechanisms of action, um, ways of delivery that are really exciting. Um, I mentioned somewhat the cancer vaccines. That's an area with that we're really hoping to hear some exciting stuff, maybe as soon as April. And then cytokine therapies, so novel IL-2s. Dr. Atkins mentioned how IL-2 was the first immunotherapy really out there for melanoma. And now there are efforts to make that therapy better. And so there's tons of trials in that space going on. We mentioned the TIL therapy, heard a little about NK cell therapy and uh, potentially even some CAR T cell therapies. There are a bunch of efforts to make TIL therapy even better, to modify TILs, to use exciting things like CRISPR and other techniques to change the TILs outside the body before giving them back so that they're stronger and better and more powerful. So there's tons going on in that space. And then, of course, immune checkpoint inhibitors. We've got PD-1, we've got CTLA-4, we've got LAG-3 but there's tons of more exploration in that space as well. So there's really a ton going on within the melanoma space. I wanted to kind of highlight some of what I see as the big questions that are hopefully going to be answered within the next few years. Um, these, many of these trials both include cutaneous melanoma as well as mucosal. Um, there are also some efforts very specific to mucosal and uveal going on given some of the differences between those tumors um, that where there's tons of exciting stuff going on. But none of these trials could happen without you guys. It's having patients willing to go on trials, to go through these therapies, and to work with us as oncologists that really is the most important piece of this. So thank you. It's so important being able to have you participate and work with us and advocate for getting these therapies to patients and being able to develop them so that we can help all of our patients at all stages of their disease. So thank you.
Hi, um, I have a question um, really about, um, I guess, the vaccines and, the, and, and trying to be more proactive. So I and my uh, siblings have a BAP1 germline mutation. Um, and among us, we have about 25 melanomas and a couple of mesotheliomas. Um, and when I first heard about the melanoma vaccine, I thought, oh, this is great. Our, our, my daughter and niece, nephews and, who have the same mutation, like we can get ahead of it, but I understand it's actually therapeutic and not preventative. That said, does it make sense to look at it as a preventative for people who are at such high risk like we are? So, and, and so that's, that's one of my questions. The other question is, um, I know this is a pretty um, rare mutation, although it's becoming wide, more widely seen. Um, are there any studies that you know of about mutations like that and whether, how they impact the cancers that we're developing as a result of the mutation, if that makes sense? Yes. Um. So let me work backwards, if that's okay. So I know that there's a lot of effort to look at BEP1 mutations. Um, it's, um, as of yet, I have not, as you know, to kind of answer the, the vaccine question, I haven't yet heard of work specifically targeting changes from BAP1, you know, if, targeting BAP1 somehow for vaccines, so I don't know. But I do know that there is work looking at um, kind of BAP1, what effects it's having in the cell, so at many levels. So at the basic science level, what is it doing because it's causing the tumors at the, you know, kind of are there ways to kind of ther do some sort of therapeutic based upon that mutation. So I do know there's a bunch of work looking at that. Um, how, but as of yet, don't know of any kind of therapeutics that I know of. There may be something out there, but don't know of anything yet that I know of that's in actual clinical testing. Um, in terms of the vaccines, it is hard because most of the vaccines that I would, that I'm talking about today really are they're based on the individual tumor. And so it is about taking out that tumor and making a vaccine to that tumor. Almost like you do, you know, when they try to predict the flu and they like, you know, get it wrong every year, but like try and figure out which things it is. So it's, um, there have been efforts in the past to do more broad, oops, sorry, more broad vaccines that may prevent melanoma in a general way, but have not yet been all that successful. Good news, though, although maybe for not for a while, is that in melanoma, what we do is we start in the advanced setting and we slowly move earlier and earlier. And so everything we develop for stage three melanoma moves into stage two melanoma, potentially moves into a more preventative space if it can be effective. So if it turns out that they find, wow, every single vaccine we developed had this same neoantigen or the same thing, why don't we just make a vaccine to that and give it, you know, and so it, it may be that something's found over time. Um, but as of yet, we're not there yet. Now it's kind of more focused on just the individual tumors. But hopefully, maybe that'll be the next thing. Hi, thank you. Over here. <laughs> oh, here I am. <laughs> I know, you can't tell where it's coming from. Um, I just wanted to ask you a quick question. Are you familiar with Dr. Henson Sal? Yeah. I, I figured you would be. Um, I worked with him years ago. And back in the late 90s, Dr. Sal described the vaccine process. That was 24 years ago or more. And just wondering why it has taken so long. Yeah. Thank you. That's a <laughs> That's a great question. Um, so I think a lot of it, you know, our technology has advanced a lot in terms of our ability to sequence. You know, it used to be that sequencing the genome took 
whatever, months, whereas now it takes hours. And so that the, it, I think a lot of it has to do with our ability to, to do things like sequencing, um, the amount of work that goes into kind of predicting those neoantigens, you know, the sequencing, the prediction of the neoantigen, figuring out what is going on is actually quite intensive to make each of these vaccines. And so I think in many ways, Dr. Sao was a visionary and the science had to catch up to him. I, I think, <laughs> I think it, was his, it was a concept with him. He talked about this concept. Yeah. I mean, he's brilliant, we know yeah. that. <laughs> and so I think the science had to catch up and hopefully these days we've got so many better tools, the science can just move that much faster. Thank you. Yeah. Um, also just right here. <laughs> so kind of going back to your original thoughts um, when we first started about picking the right patients and kind of going off pathology. So I'm kind of a unicorn among the unicorns. Um, <laughs> in my 11 year diagnosis, I'm the only nevoid malignant melanoma person I've met outside of one other who's no longer with us. So as you know, pathology on that is a bit of a, a, bit of a bear. Yeah. <laughs> and so what happens when you don't get that breast low level? Because I never got mine. Right. It was transected. So as we go into these other sub-rare subtypes, or these rare subtypes, mucosal, acral, um, ocular, I'm also in as essence part of that, and if not even more rare, because there's not that many of us, along with Desmo and all of those spindle cell and things like that. Right. So what, in the terms of this kind of sequencing and this kind of treatment, how does that look for those of us that really just kind of float among the many? Right, so I think this is where, so in terms of things like not getting answers, like depth, like all of these other things, you know, I think this is where improving understanding, and all of us work really closely with our pathologists, with our teams, really make sure that we get a lot of information from what we can in terms of the tumors. Genetics has become incredibly helpful. We've started, you know, we do, we sequence all of our patients' um, tumors in order to look for major genetic drivers and figure out what's going on. Um, but there is still, there are still a lot of issues. And in terms of some of these subtypes, I mean, we talked about how tumor mutation burden and other things can influence how therapies work, how um, immune, so certain areas of the body, so in uveal melanoma, we think that, you know, the liver is probably less immune infiltrated, and so how do, you know, is that why immune therapies don't work as well there? Um, so there's a lot of factors that play into each of these rare melanomas. Um, I think a lot of the efforts by groups like this that do kind of try to not just, you know, to, ooh, to not, to look at the forest, but then also zoom in on the trees and look at, say, okay, well, why is this different? Why is this not? Going back to some of these studies, why did so-and-so not respond? And, right. and what, what was different about their melanoma? And I think um, being able to tease out these subtypes and then also tease out why by doing genetic testing and other things will be really helpful. And I think my concern, just, just to kind of preface that a little bit more, is that I didn't get any of that information on my pathology. Right. And my original tumor was completely botched. Um, right. So I'm just kind of sitting here in limbo and have been for 11 years now. Yeah. Um, with that being said, you know, we did have my proliferative index was low, KI67 was low, but my HMB45 was there, right. which we know is a marker for that. So when you start getting into these tests and you're saying, okay, well, let's go off pathology, but what happens when that pathology <laughs> isn't there? Fair. No, I know. I know. That is really hard. And that's... Um, that's where maybe some of these other tools could start to become useful, right. like circulating tumor DNA or other things. Right, to and get I a think real sense. But yeah. maybe from the physician thing, when you come across these really rare things that if there isn't enough, is the genetic testing maybe we should be done right then? Because right. I was very fortunate to send my tumor much later, and, and by that point it had degraded so much that there was no information that we could pull from it. Right. Oh, that's too bad. Yeah. <laughs> I know. It's just. <laughs> yeah. No, but. and and we do. I mean, when we come across ones that are less right. typical, we're very quick to send it for genetic testing. Well, I, yeah. I'm glad. 2012 <laughs> to now, that's a lot of progress. Yeah. So, thank you. 
All right, we have time for one more question. Is, is, oh, it's on. Mar my name is Mary Harper. Um, I, ha I, I just have a comment. I feel really sorry for the person who had the 11th line of treatment. In <laughs> I, I want to say as a patient, even the first line treatment leaves you sometimes recovering for a while. So I can't imagine going through 11. So I sure hope that person did well. Yeah, <laughs> I hope so too. <laughs> but the other thing I want to point out, it, I, I'm in the mucosal melanoma warriors group. I, I had nasal mucosal melanoma, and I was really lucky because they gave me neoadjuvant at Benevo. And uh, there's a lot of our compatriots. They, they, they will give them Pembro as adjuvant, and all of my genetic analysis indicated Pembro and nivolumab wouldn't work very well for me. Yeah. Um, I don't know how I was so lucky. I mean, I'm, I'm almost two years Ned, um, but um, I just, I just, I just feel like people follow the melanoma, cutaneous melanoma thread, I and I have to say, um, to not do neoadjuvant at Benevo is a mistake, because it I only had one dose two weeks before the margin surgery. And when they did the margin surgery, they found no melanoma. That's fantastic. So I, I was a fast responder. And I think that there's a lot of effort um, to start building trials specific for mucosal melanoma. Yeah. And, and to start, um, a lot of us are much more aggressive from the get-go with mucosal melanoma as we're learning that and realizing that it is one that where if you really want to hit it with both. But I have to say a lot of my compatriots are being treated by cutaneous melanoma doctors right. who follow the melan cutaneous melanoma path. And they sometimes die because of that. So. Yeah, no, I know, that's very unfortunate. I know, I know, but it is, it's important to keep that in mind in terms of trials. Yeah, and in terms of getting trials specific for mucosal Yeah, having melanoma. an arm that's specific because right. melanoma would be Which lovely. Is, yeah. yeah, something I think we're all trying hard to yep. to do more and to get companies excited about and to get, um, yeah, to get funding organizations excited about. It's much, it's much more common in China. Maybe some cross national research might also. Provide. Yeah, so we work a lot and we do collaborate with China. Although most of the trials are being done kind of entirely in China as opposed to across. Um, and uh, I think we've been lucky to see that they have been able to get a lot done. And there's a ton in mucosal melanoma to be looked at, both in terms of, you know, we heard earlier about VEGF inhibition, so looking at affecting the vasculature. Um, and so it's an area that we just need a lot more trials, a lot more going on in, so. Thank you. Yeah. All right, so thank you so much, Dr. Buffender. We really appreciate everything. Um, I also uh, made a flub uh, and skipped our break. Uh, we were already a little over, and it kind of got us back on track, but that was entirely my fault. So I do just want to mention that like, if you need to take care of yourself, please do so. There are restrooms right out at, and to the left after you pass registration. There's also some refreshments, coffee, water, um, some snacks. So please make sure you're, you're taking care of yourself today. Um, we're going to ask the next panel to, to come to get themselves settled, and then we'll We'll, we'll get started here in maybe two or three minutes, okay?
All right, if we could all start migrating back to our seats. Hey everybody, we'd like to we'd like to get started again. It's always hard. <laughs> oh, I have created a monster. All right. If everybody can get back to their seats, please, we'd like to get started. See, this is good if you take it. All right, so throughout your journey with melanoma, few relationships are more important than the bonds between you and your doctor. You are a team, and teams work best when the communication flows freely in both directions. As a patient, you want the unique features of your disease, to, uh, you want the unique features of your disease to be considered when making treatment decisions, and you also want it to meet your personal needs, values, and, and your goals for treatment. Learning how to communicate effectively with your doctor and care team to set expectations and to learn how to prepare for each of your appointments to make the most use of your time are important strategies to make sure that you're making the, the most out of your health care and that, that, that you're really uh, being proactive about what's happening. I'm thrilled to introduce our next panel, which will be led by Wal Cornell's Dr. Anna Pavlik. Uh, they're going to make the case, uh, along with our panelists, Christina Baum and Nadia Jabri, on why communication matters, how you can be proactive to improve the way that you communicate with your care team, and uh, how that can improve the, the care that you receive. Thank you. Well, thank you, Cody. Um, I'm going to stand to the side since I can't see over the top. Um, so today we're going to talk about patient and doctor communication, some of the issues that occur when patients are in your office, um, and how to better improve patient understanding. Um, I think a lot of us are really not cognizant of how health illiteracy is out there in the majority of the patients. Really only about 10 to 12 percent of our patients really fully understand what we talk about when we discuss things with them. So what's important about communication? Well, I think the most important thing about communication is that each partner, each part of the team has to listen to one another. I mean, when you look at this first point, um, is this the point? It's not the point. Um, but we're going to make the point that doctors will allow their patients to talk for about six seconds before they interrupt them. What do you learn in six seconds? Not a whole lot. Um, and we also, there was also another study that looks at men and women, and they also behave very differently in their physician's office. Men don't ask, don't ask questions. Women, maybe five or six. Um, but again, why not? Are, is there an intimidation? Do they not just understand? Um, and so when we look at good communication skills, why is that important? Because you have to form a trust with your patient. The patient has to trust you. And you likewise have to trust that the patient is going to effectively communicate what's going on with them. Otherwise, it's going to really impact the quality of their care. Um, the more that a patient believes and trusts in you, the easier it's going to be to understand therapies, get patients to be compliant and understand why they're being compliant, maybe participate in a clinical trial because they truly believe that you have their best interest at heart, although we always do, sometimes patients may be leery. And so these are just some of the things that are the good side of good communication. Um, and again, why are we talking about loss in translation? And, and this goes back to what I was talking about, where we as physicians, we're always, you know, we're always on a clock. We're always, 
know, we've got a meeting to go to, we've got 27 patients in the waiting room, will come in assuming that the nurse practitioner or the physician assistant has already spoken with the patient. So we're going to come in, we're going to say, hey, what's going on? Um, okay, so I, I hear this is going on, that's great. And you're going to essentially regurgitate what the patient told the nurse and never let the patient fill in the blanks. Because sometimes when you do, you find out a whole lot more than what patients reveal to your healthcare providers, um, like your nurse or your PA. It, it wouldn't surprise me at all, you know, when I walk in and I say to the patient, so I understand that you've had uh, trouble sleeping. And, you know, I'll say to my nurse, well, why? And I'll say, well, they, they, they've, they've just got things going on and they're stressed about their disease. If you give that patient more than about six seconds, I bet you're going to find out a whole lot more about why they're not sleeping. Are there marital issues because the patient is sick? Um, are they having financial difficulty? Is there a problem with paying for medicine? Um, you know, there are so many different aspects to patient care um, that we as providers really need to acknowledge, um, but we never give them the opportunity. Um, and so these are just some, uh, you're all going to have a copy of these slides, some of the things that we brought out that we found in research that really does inhibit a good patient-doctor communication. Um, and how did we get here? Well, we got here because fortunately things are moving very quickly. Um, the world moves very quickly. We don't have time for anything. We don't have time to talk to one another. Um, but I think we need to. We can learn so much. Um, we have this panel here today. I am representing I think I'm representing the doctor today. Um, I have worn all of these hats. I, you know, I haven't been a patient, but I have been a caregiver um, for my husband who had cancer. And so I, I get what it's like to sit on this panel. So I'm going to wear two hats today. Um, but we have a cancer survivor, and we have a patient advocate who took care of their mom with cancer. Um, and so what we're going to do today is we want this to be a very active, interactive session where we're going to talk about some of the things that were the pros of communication and some of the things that were really cons and really turned us off um, and what we can learn from that and how we can do better. So with that, I am going to move to our discussion to talk a little bit about experiences that we had. Let's start out on the good note. Experiences that we've had that have been very positive with our healthcare providers. And so I'm going to pass that over and let you ladies introduce yourselves. Sure. Uh, thank you, Dr. Pavlik. I'm Christina Baum, uh, as Cody mentioned. I am a melanoma survivor right now, as far as we know. Um, <laughs> so I have dealt with melanoma three different times, um, from stage 3A to metastasized to my kidney to brain mets. Um, done two clinical trials. I was a phase one patient on the Optulog trial, so yay phase one patients. Um, that being said, I think, you know, going into a clinical trial specifically, you know, you do need to have robust communication with your medical team. Um, to answer Dr. Pavlik's question, I think some of the good experiences that I've had um, have been just reaching out to my medical team um, when I have side effects, and I know if you're like me and you're not a hypochondriac, you don't want to email your doctor and your nurse when you have just a headache or just kind of a stomach ache or these things that seem so small to you uh, are actually a big deal to them. So if, especially if you're in a clinical trial, this is data that matters to them. So when you're communicating these different side effects, these small things could actually be a big deal. And so it really is in your interest and your benefit to communicate these small things, albeit, like I said, if you're just having a stomach ache or a headache. Uh, for me, for example, um, during the phase one study that I was on, uh, I started having a headache, started getting nauseous, and this went on for three days. and. Uh, at the time, I did have a stressful job. I was a communications director on Capitol Hill. So if you know anything about our government, no two dates are the same, and it's not very smooth sometimes. 
So that being said, uh, I just kind of attribute this to stress. And sure enough, I went in for treatment on Friday per usual. And at that point, Tylenol wasn't working, Advil wasn't working. Um, I light and sound just felt her. It felt like a really horrible hangover, but no alcohol. So that being said, um, what we learned in that time is that I was having one of those adverse responses called autoimmune meningitis, which is where your immune system recognizes your brain as cancer, and it starts attacking your brain. So, and it's very serious. You can get brain damage from it if you don't act quickly. But fortunately for me, I took initiative to communicate these small symptoms to my medical team, and in which case, they were able to manage it. I didn't have permanent damage or anything of that nature. And sure enough, this drug, thank God, went on to go through multiple phases and is now FDA approved. So um, I think that's just one positive that I've had in working with my medical team is just you want to over-communicate, especially if you're in a clinical trial. My name is Nadia. I took care of my mother, uh, whose name was Ursula, um, for about six years before she passed away from melanoma at uh, home with me alone during the pandemic. So I had that experience. Um, and what I really want to do today is share um, what I learned mostly in hindsight that I wish I knew at the time, which was that communications is hard. Um, I didn't know that it was a thing that we all struggle with, whether you're a clinician, a nurse, uh, you know, the admin person who just answers the phone, um, or the patient. I, I just assumed it was my failing that I couldn't ramp up fast enough in six years to memorize every single drug name, or you know, that I wasn't able to advocate for my mother as fast as not fast enough as I would have wished for. Um, that I couldn't negotiate with doctors about why I felt like she needed proteomic molecular testing, uh, and you know, and they would just say no, and I'm like, but why not? And I tried to make a, you know, make a discussion. Oh, really? <laughs> you mic'd me. <laughs> okay, sorry. Should I start from the beginning? <laughs> I knew I'm probably smashing the the microphone with my elbow. Um, Anyway, I, I only learned really at the end and afterwards that communications is a skill that patients need to learn. Patients need to basically go to school, uh, cancer school, to learn how to be a patient. Caregivers need to go to a, a caregiver school to learn you know, how to manage their relationship with their loved one now that their loved one has a... Um, potentially deadly disease um, and how to communicate with not just one clinician that you might get to know over a long period of time but multiple clinicians uh, tons of people uh, you know my mother went through different medical systems um, I met so many people I'd have to write down you know so many different names so you're dealing with so many personalities um, sometimes you know you meet a whole new team at during the last few weeks of your loved one's life. And so it's, it's difficult to communicate in general. And I thought, again, like I, I said when I wasn't mic'd properly, that I thought it was my failing. I didn't realize that that was something that all of us need to deal with. And there should be training and that there are things that you can do. There are resources out there. And that's what I'm hoping that we can discuss more of. Um, and for, for me as a, as a caregiver, from that perspective, some of the unique dynamics that I went through, albeit, you know, I was a, a child taking care of my elderly mother that's very different than what a lot of other caregivers maybe out there deal with, but there are some things that are, are similar in terms of um, how best to work with a team and to ask the questions. I mean, here we're, we're dealing with a communications expert <laughs> who is, you know, maybe sometimes challenged to, t to communicate uh, for, her, for her care. But as a caregiver, you can sometimes ask questions that your loved one is afraid to ask. In the case of my mother, she often, she was the type that didn't want to, um, didn't want to raise, you know, raise a flag when she wasn't feeling well. And we would get to the appointment after having reviewed all of her symptoms, reviewing the notes together, and she would get there and in front of the doctor say, nothing is wrong. I'm fine, I'm fine, because she wanted to be the good patient. And I would have to play the bad cop and say, you are not fine, and this is why, and list all of the things. And she took it as a personal kind of 
insult as if I was criticizing her by calling her out on all of the symptoms and struggles that she was having that we talked about sharing with the doctor and why we needed to talk about it with the doctor. So sometimes, you know, as a caregiver, you can lift, um, do the heavy lifting sometimes, but, you know, there are also some, um, uh, a burden to that that we can get into. So that's the, that's the positive takeaway, is that there are ways to learn about communication, and we all should learn um, what we can to try to communicate better, because outcomes and quality of life do depend on that. Oh, and, and to just dovetail on what you said, um, you know, there, there are patients who want to know everything, and including your references, including where you went to medical school and what your GPA was. <laughs> um, and then there are the other patients, like your mom, who just don't want to know anything. But the, and, and so as a, as a physician, you know, you've you got to find out what, and it's usually pretty easy to know who wants to know your GPA. Um, What's your GPA, Dr. Uh, <laughs> I'm just kidding. I, was I supposed to go to medical school? Oh, sorry. Um, but then you have the caregiver. So you've got the patient who doesn't really want to know anything because that's, that's just how they deal. But then you've got the caregiver who comes in on the very first visit. And then, you know, you're telling the patient, yes, um, you have melanoma. It's gone to you know your lungs. This is what our treatment options are. You know, we talk about clinical trials. We talk about you know if the patient hasn't been staged. Well, then we need to do some take some pictures. So, what's the what's a what's a PET scan? What's a CAT scan? What's an MRI? I mean, we we use these terms like we think that everybody knows what they are. Um, Patients may or may not ask you, what's the difference between the MRI and what's the difference between a PET scan and a CAT scan? Um, so I, I like to give patients and their family members the opportunity to tell me what they want to know. Um, because if a patient really doesn't want to know, then the patient has the right not to know. If that's how they're going to deal with this, then I have to respect that. Um, but likewise, they've got a family member or a close friend or whoever their caregiver is who has these burning questions because they are going to be taking care of this person. And so one of the things that I usually do at the, at the end of the, my first visit with patients is say, listen, I will answer all your questions, whatever you want to know. However, if there's a question that you as the patient don't want to know the answer to, you need to speak up and tell me, I don't want to know that question. I don't want to know that answer. Because your caregiver may say, and I've had it happen many times, where you know, you've got the patient and they're, they're pretty much the deer in the headlights of, oh my goodness, I have cancer. And that's all they're thinking about is, oh my goodness, I have cancer. And then I've got the caregiver who's already four, four miles down the road who's on the question of, so what's the prognosis and how long do they have? So again, I, I, I like to put it out there that if a caregiver has those questions, as long as the patient says it's OK for me to talk to the caregiver and give them the information that they want and they need in order to provide the best care for their loved one, I say, OK, at the end of the visit, I say to the patient, well, your daughter, son, uncle, whoever it is, has some questions. If you don't want to be present, why don't you just go have a seat in the waiting room, and I'm going to answer these few questions for them, and then you know, we'll, we'll let you go home. But I think it's really important to respect what a patient wants to hear and what they don't want to hear and also to provide them with information when they're ready to hear it. Um, especially how long do I have? Family members always want to know how long somebody's got. Very rarely patients want to know how long they've got. Um, at least not on the first visit, at least not in my experience. As patients get further along in their disease, if they're getting worse and things are not getting better, 
then I will have a patient say, all right, doc, you know, we've been at this for a while. How long do you think I have? Um, and, and that's when we sit down and we have that serious conversation. Um, as someone who was on the receiving end of getting information I was not prepared for, I actually had my husband's oncologist come up to me, clear out of the blue and say, you know, he's only got about six months. Like you were telling me, would you like a venti latte at Starbucks? Um, and I, I have to tell you, even though I am in this profession, that's not what I was ready to hear. I was just processing the fact that it was metastatic. I know what metastatic means. I know he's going to die. And I was not ready to know. In my head, as the doctor, I knew that six months. But knowing in your head and then having somebody validate it and hear it makes it real. So I just, I think it's very important that when we provide patients with information, we really make sure that they are ready to hear that information. Um, because maybe because that happened to me, I am now very hypersensitive to that and I make sure I never blurt out, well, you know, you better get your affairs in order. Um, and sometimes you do, but there are ways to gently approach that topic and unless it's going to be imminent within, you know, it's very rare that you as an oncologist see a patient for the very first time and that patient is never gonna come back and see you again. Has it happened? Yeah, um, it's happened like three times in my career where my very first visit with somebody was like, holy moly, we have to have that talk because this is, you're just entirely too sick, this is too far gone and we need to get things in order for you and your family. Um, but if you've got somebody who has metastatic disease, I think you need to open up the conversation, but you open it up gently, and every time the patient comes back, you can build on that. And so you build that trust, and you're able to prepare the patient and the family and not blindside them with some fact and by the way, they were wrong. It was nine months and six, and it wasn't six months. But as the person who was that caregiver, when six months hits, you look at that calendar and you're like, oh God, it wasn't today. Is it gonna be tomorrow? And every day after that, you think, is it gonna be today? Is it gonna be today? Um, and it's a really crummy way to live because it takes away from the quality time that I was supposed to have, as opposed to thinking, is it gonna be today? Um, I don't know if you had any kind of experiences like that, but you know, getting information where you just weren't ready to hear it or not getting information that you should have had. I think I have sort of the opposite because, uh, and, and I think the data show that patients don't find out mostly about end of life until way too late. Uh, and the data also show that patients aren't really informed about their prognosis about end of life in general and are not prepared for end of life and nor are their caregivers. And in my experience, I felt like I had advocated for my mother for so long that when that time came, not only was I oddly surprised and not ready, but I was not prepared at all and didn't know how to do it. And it was too late to learn how to advocate at end of life because that's a whole different game than advocating during treatment. Um, and so I felt like I really failed as a daughter because I didn't have time to figure this out. And so it was, it's an issue that I've become passionate about since then and want to raise awareness around end of life within the melanoma community so, um, so that we can be better prepared for those of us that want to be prepared. You know, I, and I'm not saying that everybody should be told whatever the clinician wants to tell them. I think it's up to the patients to, like you said, inform the clinician how much they want to know um, and when, and not just once, but over and over. And I think you have to repeatedly tell your clinician I really want to know everything and not just 
um, what I'm able to ask the questions about because I happen to know the words. If I don't know the words or don't know to ask the questions, I want to know anyway. Like, be proactively informing me. And you, if that's the kind of patient and caregiver that you are, you have to kind of keep reminding your clinician about it because you might not be lucky to get a doctor like Dr. Pavlik who wants to be transparent about prognosis and wants to be transparent also about side effects and believes that you as the patient um, defines what quality of life is and what side effects you want to take on and what side effects you don't. Uh, because patients have options for treatments. Patients um, have options about you know, what to do when, but unless you, you know and advocate for yourself, then you, you won't find out. And if you're the kind of patient that doesn't want to do that work, that's great. But if you're the kind of patient that wants to continue learning and become better at communicating, um, you should have the right to do so and not be blocked by anyone on your care team. Uh, and there are resources out there in the peer-to-peer -peer community to learn how to communicate better, to find out what other doctors are doing. So if you hear Dr. Pavlik talking um, about, you know, that she would like to be told by her patients how much they want to know and she'll respect that, then you get the idea, oh wait, just because my doctor doesn't do that doesn't mean that it's not possible because clinicians are not taught uh, in school. You're not taught in medical school, which is shocking. Um, many doctors don't know anything about end of life. They, you know, they say goodbye to the patient. They have no idea what hospice is like. So we're all in this together to, to learn and inform and hopefully have more conversations as equal stakeholders at the table trying to come up with better ways to talk to each other. Yeah, and I would just say as the, the patient, um, look, I think all of us are in this room because at some point we received news that was not good, right? So um, it's really how you digest that information. I know for myself, <clears throat> you know, when I learned I had brain mets, you know, I straight up asked my oncologist um, if I was dying. And he said, that's a possibility. And it was just like, whoa, hold on. Kind of exactly what Dr. Pavlik is talking about. And that's really like all you can retain at that moment. Everything else is just like Charlie Brown teacher. And um, I remember I went home that night and I couldn't sleep and it was all I could think about. And, you know, brain mets is not great. I think we all know that. Um, but I think what ended up being really helpful is I had a medical team who was really willing to walk me through everything and answer all my questions. Um, for me, when I was diagnosed with brain mats, unfortunately, I got diagnosed right before Christmas one year. <laughs> um, so, and if you have ever been diagnosed before Christmas, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Like, you cannot schedule your appointments. Everybody's on holidays. And when you're a patient with that news, the first thing you want to do is get moving, get scheduled. I want to start treatment. We're, let's go, let's go. And um, at the holidays, that's simply not happening. <laughs> so. I was really fortunate to have a radi radiation oncologist who called me on Christmas Eve and talked me through everything for one hour. Um, and that just meant the world to me. And it really allowed me to enjoy my holiday with my family, which at the time could have been the very last holiday that I had. So I was really grateful for that. And I will say, kind of uh, to what Nadia is mentioning is, I think you do have to be a strong advocate for yourself. And, you know, it's, look, I've been doing this 10 or 11 years now, this whole melanoma game. So it's, I, I received a piece of advice from a research nurse I had in 2016, and Alice Pons, if you're watching, sorry, I'm not gonna cuss, but um, she told me that the best thing you can do for yourself, she goes, Christina, you just need to be a jerk, which except she didn't say jerk. Um, <laughs> And it was right when, you know, this other nurse was messing up, like, with my veins and all this stuff. And I realized, you know what? She's right. She's absolutely right. You have to take control. No one's going to come in there and rescue you. And if you're like me, I'm a single person doing this all by myself. And you've, you've got to take initiative. And so I learned what that looks like. And if you hear the word no or we can't do that or call again later, I mean, 
you be persistent, be consistent. Like you're a patient and you have so much value in being that figure on your care team. You are the most important person on your care team. It's you, the patient. And so, <laughs> so I think, you know, use whatever, whatever you think is best. And I, it's like I tell people, the most important thing is that you trust your provider, that you trust your medical team. And you need to have that. And if you don't trust them, then find a different one. This is a shop for value market. So you can fire people and go hire another team. So um, that being said, I've been really fortunate. Um, in my experience, I've had two oncologists really kind of managing my care. Um, the main one I have is Dr. Lipson at Hopkins, and then I have Dr. Talby at MD Anderson. So I'm sure he's not here, but he already knows there's a shout out. Um, but I'm really lucky that they're friends and that they can sit down over dinner and discuss my case if, if it needs to be that way. And if that's something that you want, then you need to ask for that. And don't feel bad asking for that and wanting that on your medical team. Um, again, you're the biggest player and you're the decision maker. You are the captain of your own ship. And be a jerk, except not that. <laughs> I wish, I wish I had known you uh, when, <laughs> when my mother was alive because um, it, do, it doesn't come naturally to me. But next to my mother, I was able to do a lot more than I would have done for myself. Um, and she gave me a lot of flack for it too because it wasn't in her nature. So that kind of caused some disruptions in, in our relationship. Of course, later she would say, I know, I know that you had to ask those questions, but I just was embarrassed, you know, or, or whatever. And so we had to come up with a game plan. I mean, this is from the caregiver perspective of coming up with a game plan of discussing what you're gonna discuss, like have a meta conversation about what you're gonna discuss before going in and knowing that it might not go well, not in terms of the answer that you're, I mean, the prognosis wise, but I mean, you know, m maybe the appointment will be really delayed and then you'll, you'll have, you know, only 10 minutes with your oncologist or something, you know, things may not go according to plan, but at least you go in with a game plan in terms of what you want to find out at your appointment. Um, when, you know, maybe she wants me to step out of the room at what point or vice versa. She, she, I have a sidebar with the doctor. And then afterwards, we always planned to have a debrief where we would go have, you know, go to a restaurant. No matter what the struggle was, we would somehow get to eat because that was our thing. Um, you know, even if I had to push her in a wheelchair, which I did, she was like, we are going to eat. And we would discuss, you know, what was said so that we could both be on the same page. Inevitably, we weren't because two people always hear things differently. And then you have to have a way to sort of follow up with your provider. And Dr. Pavlik taught me that only recently that some providers actually offer a way to follow up with their patients. <laughs> if you have any questions, you can email me. What? I didn't know that, and so I always went into appointments being so nervous that not only would I not get through my questions, but that I wouldn't understand the answer, that I wouldn't be able to write it down fast enough, I wouldn't be able to read my writing afterwards. So now what I try to say in hindsight to other patients and caregivers is record your appointments. Uh, you know, discuss before going in, email the questions that you might have ahead of time. Some providers might look them over, some don't wanna know what you wanna ask and won't answer what you ask and won't want you to follow up, because that does exist. Uh, we all have those kinds of struggles in, in healthcare, but many do. And if you propose it, they might be open to it because it will in the end make their job easier. So I think having game plans with your care partner uh, really helps and to be able to follow up and make sure you're on the same page. Yeah, and uh, again, as a provider, I think it's also important to gauge your patient and their caregiver's level of understanding. Again, and it's not education level, it's healthcare literacy. It's what do you understand about all these terms that we're using that in our heads are everyday language like, I don't know, emesis. Okay, go up to a person in the street and ask them if they know what the word emesis means. I guarantee you nobody does. Or like till therapy, I was like, yeah. till, until what? Till, <laughs> yeah, I don't know. 
Um, <laughs> and immunotherapy. Um, you know, that, that brings us to how do we as providers talk to our patients about treatment options? You know, what is the clinical trial? You know, you were on a clinical trial. I think that's fabulous. I think that should be the first thing out of every oncologist's mouth is we've got this clinical trial and you're eligible. Let's talk about what a clinical trial is. But again, that takes time. So you have to make sure that you've earmarked your enough time for you to talk to your patient about that. Um, and if you're going to talk about immunotherapy, how do, you de how do you describe what immunotherapy is to a patient? Um, you know, I think some, you know, I am a terrible artist, um, but I make stick figures and I make circles. <laughs> um, and most people, most people watch TV or watch movies. So I try to use, um, I try to find a movie that people have seen and explain immunotherapy based on the movie. I like to use Independence Day because most people have seen Independence Day. So we explain T cells and cancer cells based on the melanoma cell is the alien ship, the fighter pilots are the T cells and how the T cell has to go up there, shoot in the right spot and then boom, it explodes and everybody does the, oh, is that how that works? Um, and it's a very simplistic way, but no matter what your level of education, you get it. And that's all that matters is that when patients leave the office, they get what you're going to be trying to do for them. Um, and so you have to sometimes be creative. You know, pictures work for some people. Um, pictures work for most people. We're using analogies like the movies. Unfortunately, there's some people who don't watch TV at all, and then you're really stuck. Um, and I actually found out there are people in this world who do have never seen Star Wars. <laughs> never, not one. And I found out that's my sister-in-law. <laughs> and I was like, what's wrong with you? Um, but you try and find some kind of common ground. Um, and, you, and you go from there. And again, it's very helpful. It opens up that conversation. Because then if patients don't quite understand, um, they can then say, well, if, if my fighter pilot doesn't get in here, what happens? And the answer is pretty much nothing. Um, what else do we want to talk about? Actually, I'd love to hear I, from, from you, Dr. Pavlik. How can patients be better at communicating, and how can caregivers be better at communicating from a doctor's point of view? I mean, we can talk about how we would like clinicians to uh, improve their communication skills, but I don't know how much time we have left, but I'd be curious to hear from a clinician's point of view what you think, because you, you mentioned some, something when we were talking earlier about how caregivers can be really helpful, but they can also be pains in the butt. <laughs> um, you know, I'm, I'm a big advocate of lists. I tell everybody, write it down. Write down your questions, because once you get here, nobody remembers what you wanted to ask me. You've got, whatever, three or four weeks between treatments. You know, have a notepad that you have and you have, and then bring them in, and let's go through them. Um, you know, the wonderful joy of electronic medical records gives you instant access to your doctor 24-7, yay. Um, <laughs> and, you know, uh, sometimes on Sunday morning I get up with my cup of coffee and there's the four emails of, can you explain? And I'm like, no, I haven't had my coffee yet. Um, I thought I drew it for you. <laughs> <laughs> but it allows me to also put it in writing for them because what I thought they may have understood, clearly they didn't understand. And if I could explain it, and, and what you have to keep in mind is when you explain to people, you know, just like an informed consent, you can't talk in language higher than third grade, no matter what degree somebody has, because patients need to understand it, need to throw away that medical jargon and just answer their question. Well, and I think too, to your point that when you're discussing your diagnosis or your treatment plan, I mean, you want to get to a solution, get to a path forward. But you're also really overwhelmed. 
by this news and that you're there and you're anxious and you're stressed and I don't know um, it, anything with mental health like your your amygdala and not to go into medical jargon is overriding your prefrontal cortex to try and save you so it's it's a lot to memorize and remember in the moment so I do think if you are a patient then you're seeking um, that next step, you know, after you read news or discussing treatment or even along the way, I, I think you should really not be afraid to seek out appropriate mental health resources to help you deal with that news. I mean, that is so, so important. I know for myself, like I started therapy right when I got diagnosed because I needed to deal with this. And to your point, I wrote down all my questions, a list to take into my oncologist. I wrote about 16 questions. And after a while, we realized it was all the same question, just said 16 different ways, which was, am I dying? So, um, and that's my anxiety talking, right? So it's that if there's a more manageable way for me to deal with anxiety and dealing with cancer is depressing, you know, like it's being depressed or being anxious about what you're dealing with is super normal. So you're not alone and don't be afraid to be an advocate for your own mental health while you're at it. I mean, your quality of life is, is up to you, and that's one way I think that you can um, really address that head on and just deal with your anxiety. And um, I mean, I, I know I had it, so it wouldn't be normal if you didn't have it, so. No, but I think that is so important because underlying any diagnosis that's new to someone, there's going to be that apprehension, there's gonna be that anxiety, not only in the patient, but in the caregiver. And then sometimes you get the patient, the caregiver, whose anxiety feeds off the other one. Mm -hmm. And that's always fun to watch. It's like <laughs> Wimbledon in your office. Um, but, and, and I, I think it's so important. I think now the, the one maybe good thing that came out of the pandemic was that people are not afraid to talk about their mental health anymore. You know, mental health is okay. It's okay to say, and I, I'm at the breaking point, I need some help, I need some medicine, it, get me something. Um, whereas pre-pandemic, it was all taboo. You just brushed it under the carpet and I'm just gonna be tough and I'm gonna, you know, I'm gonna tough through it. And it, it just is such a detriment and it could really be so um, debilitating to patients, to families, to interactions. Um, and to treatment, you know, uh, it. I just wanted to offer um, uh, some, I guess, ad advice, which would be to check with your institution because different institutions have different uh, resources, not just for dealing with mental health, but to help navigate the system. I mean, some are useless, but some are really uh, good. Um, you know, whether it's a social worker, a patient navigator, even psychology or psychiatry, they can help. And they can also help with communication uh, challenges, like help me, help, you know, coach me to advocate for what I want because, you know, I'm having trouble advocating because not everybody is as talented as Christina is to, for example, you know. Just be a jerk. It, well, yeah, I mean, no, <laughs> I didn't mean to say that, but you know, it's, it's a skill because you're a communications professional. So in, in a way, it's, it's a skill that not all of us have, and especially not when your life is at stake. You can be good at communications at your job, um, but not good at communicating when your life is on the line and you're trying to develop that sense of trust that Dr. Pavlik was talking about, because in the end, you have to really trust you know, not just your oncologist, but your entire team, which as I said before, can consist of a lot of people. And sometimes people you've never met before coming into the room and you're very vulnerable. And you know, how can you communicate well under those circumstances? It's, it's like, and we don't have a system now that really promotes better communication. As I said, clinicians aren't trained, but check with your institution because a lot of institutions do have programs. I mean, there's a program called Vital Talk. Um, it's an external program that a lot of hospitals use and they put out great content on how clinicians can have difficult conversations, whether it's about end of life, um, you know, treatment transitions, and that content at through the Vital Talk website is also very helpful for patients to see how clinicians are struggling to have these conversations because clinicians are nervous as well. We, we forget that you guys are human beings, but you know, um, 
it's it's the job you get to go home at the end of, end of the day but you have you suffer a lot of moral injury day to day losing patience um, you know not wanting to have those conversations having to have conversations that you don't want to have either so you know I think we're all in this together mm -hmm. and if we try to avail ourselves of the resources that your institutions might have external programs like Vital Talk and CI has guidelines on communication that's really interesting there's a nursing program called Elevate Nurses I think it's called that's a very interesting communication program for yeah. nurses I am so sorry to interrupt, but I do want to make sure we have just a couple minutes for some audience questions. Um, I think we have one right here. And Hi. Hi. Um, here's, um, so, you know, we're all patients, caregivers, cancer adjacent advocates um, in this room. Um, and I have a communications question from that perspective. As a patient, right, I have um, the benefit of being familiar with me, because I'm me. And so I know what my personality needs are when I'm finding a provider for myself, right? I know what my communication needs are. Now, as an advocate, when a patient comes to me for advice on who should they see, right? If they live in an area that I'm not overly familiar with, my recommendation is going to be the closest, most brilliant key opinion leader. Um, and that's the person I'm going to recommend for them to go to um, when they ask me, right? Now, I have done, I do this a lot, and there is for anecdotal purposes of my question. Um, one in particular where, um, who is brilliant, and every time I recommend them to a patient, the patient calls me crying, because the brilliance and the bedside are not aligned. <laughs> so um, as an advocate, <laughs> um, what, what advice do you have, you know, as caregivers and patients, advocates, and as a physician, um, how can we as advocates help the patients that we're working with kind of navigate those communication issues, and how do we use our own advocate voices to interact with those brilliant minds to make very respectful suggestions that potentially um, there might be some room for improvement in their communication styles with patients? Um, is there anything, because I know that there can be a mentality um, very much of, from the patient side, very much similar to like, I don't want to send my food back, they'll spit in it in the kitchen. You know, it's the same kind of like, I don't want to question my oncologist, my care won't be as good, and I might be dying, and I'm not gonna, and I'm not gonna be a problem patient, I'm gonna be like the easiest, smoothest patient so that my, that I'm assured I'm getting good treatment, when really, the, as we know, the <laughs> smoothest, easiest patient often is not getting the best treatment because they're not advocating for themselves. But, but so I'm just wondering from a physician standpoint and an advocate patient caregiver standpoint, do you have any advice or best practices for helping to use our advocate voices in that regard? How to deal with a, an oncologist that's a jerk. <laughs> I mean, when you see them in, in situations like this, then, you know, they're brilliant. This is where they shine, right? So, so this friendly. is what we know as advocates. But yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I would call Christina. I, uh, yeah. <laughs> call me. Um, I, I mean, I guess my inclination is that, first and foremost, the question I would have for the patient is, do you trust this doctor? Because let's take personality out of it, right? It's, it comes to a matter of do you trust them with your care? And that's the most important question, is you need to feel confident about the person who is making these recommendations to you. They're not making your decisions for you, but they are making recommendations for you, providing you with options, and you need to feel confident about that. So I think start there. Um, bedside manner, I mean, look, you can't send people to nice school, you know? So it's, you just kind of have to I don't know, this is a growing opportunity for you to get really proactive about your own care. And if you don't like it, if it's not a good fit, then go elsewhere. I mean, we, to Dr. Pavlik's point, like we live in a day and age now where you can hire an oncologist to see you um, across the country and then just have a local clinic manager day to day. Uh, that's not unusual, tons of people do that. So I think that's a pretty solid option. If, if you just feel like you're, the trust has been broken, you're not getting anywhere, you don't even like this person, then I think it's time to find a new manager. Yeah, you know, I, I, when I see a patient for the first time, a lot of times it comes up and they'll say, 
you know, my family wants me to get a second opinion, almost like it's an insult to me. And it's the family that wants it, not me. Um, and I say, I think that's great. I said, because, you know, all I ask is that you find another doctor who is skilled in melanoma. You know, don't go see the breast cancer doctor for your second opinion, because that's not going to help. Um, but make sure that the expert that you find is a melanoma expert. You know, we, we're all, we all have that knowledge. What you have to find is the person who bets, best fits you. And if it's not me, it's, oh, I tell them right there, it is okay. Because not everybody fits my personality. You may get turned on by this other person that you go see and say, yeah, you know, they are much more business-like where, you know, you're just kind of like, go have a beer after, after work with me. Um, because you're too, you're too laid back. Find what fits you and go with it. Make sure you're comfortable with it. Make sure it's the person that you trust with your life. Um, there's no right, there's no wrongs. And just like now that we have Zoom or, you know, people can go get second opinions. You know, many times I work with local docs. I have patients that are in Colorado. I have patients that are all over the country. They'll come in, they'll see me. I'll get on the phone with their local doc. And why do you have to come see me all the time. If you can get something closer to home, that's exactly what I'd give you in New York City. Um, and it's building those partnerships and being open to working with local docs, community docs, because many times people who come into the city come from more rural, to smaller towns, and they don't have big academic centers that are easy for them to get to. So it really is building a nice collaborative practice with a local doc to provide the patient with the best that they can get. And then I tell the patients, when you get your scans, send me the disc. You know, we could do a Zoom chat. You can fly in if you want to see me. You can do whatever you want. But, and then we sit down and we have a group think. So your local oncologist, myself, you, we talk about what does the scan show and where, where should we go from here. So I think there's lots of options. Um, I wanted to comment on, um, I guess, how to discuss like issues or problems or side effects. So my sister, I was a caregiver um, with my sister, and she was um, put on Ipi Nevo and was um, really struggling with fatigue, which was a known side effect that they'd told her about. So we go to an appointment and she says, I'm really tired. And they say, yeah, I know, that's, you know, a lot of people are tired. But her fatigue got worse and worse. And I mean, I could hear it in her voice when I would talk to her on the phone. Like she just, it was too much an effort to even really talk. She, she said, when I'm trying to move laundry from the washer to the dryer, I have to sit two times and rest. Like I can't, you know, when I go upstairs, I, I, I can't get all the way up the stairs without taking a couple of breaks and sitting on the stairs. And so we go back for her next appointment and she's like, I'm just really, really tired. And they were kind of like, well, yeah, that's, that's understood. And then I chimed in and I said, no, no, no. She, she doesn't even have the energy to put an entire load of laundry from the washer to the dryer. She can't even get up the stairs without taking a couple of breaks. At which point the oncologist said, oh, that's a different story. And so I think what that, and then it turns out she had adrenal insufficiency. Mm -hmm. And so then a couple years later, my brother is dealing with mesothelioma, and he was also on Ipinibo, and my sister-in-law said, oh my gosh, he's hardly gotten out of bed for two weeks. I tried to get him to go walk the dog with me. He got, like, in front of the house and had to turn around and go back because he couldn't, you know, he got to the sidewalk and couldn't go any further. And I said, you need to take that to his doctor because that's not right, and that's what happened to Busy, my, our sister. And so I think it's important when, when you're discussing problems, if they don't see, if it's, mm -hmm. if it's something that's so like affecting your life yeah. and they don't seem to be responding, you need to keep pushing and saying, no, 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 this is not just, I need more naps. This is life altering. And so I don't know what, what you think about that or how, how do you encourage a doctor to, 
Yeah, this, this happened attention. to me uh, as well. Um, the fatigue is the pits. Like, it is terrible. And so I think what I'm hearing you say is that you and your sister didn't, you didn't feel heard. Right. You did not feel like they were listening. And I think that is a problem. And so I think you do need to spell it out for them sometimes because I think, and Dr. Pablo can probably speak to this a little bit better, I mean, I find that doctors hear patients all day, multiple times a day. They're getting emails, my chart. I mean, some of them give out their text, you know, their mobile phone numbers, God bless them. But it's just, it's a lot. And so I think sometimes there can be some fatigue, you know, on their end. And so I think when you incorporate that, you still have to make sure, like, your case is the most important case to you. And so you need to really help them understand. Uh, for myself, I had the same exact fatigue situation, um, and it was it's brutal. Like there's no way, there's no two ways about it. Um, I think at that point, that's where you have to start discussing what are the what are the options for me right now with this. If this fatigue is crippling. It's compromising my quality of life, and that's not acceptable to me. Um, for myself, that looked like prednisone, which if you're in this room, you probably know exactly what that is, and it's the worst drug ever to get the moon face and the whole nine yards. And so um, I think you, know, you just have to be willing to look at other opportunities or alternatives if you're on treatment and you're experiencing crippling fatigue. At minimum, you should be asking your doctor, what are my options? Here's what I'm experiencing. Here's how it's impacting my day-to-day -day life. And what can we do about it? And if that answer is nothing, then yeah, I think you're in the market for a second opinion at that point. There is a, uh, a podcast that uh, MSK, Memorial Sloan Kettering, puts out. And they did a podcast when one of, for interviewing one of the oncologists who was diagnosed with cancer. And one of the most memorable quotes um, in that podcast was, the, uh, my calculus as a patient changed from that of my math when I was an oncologist. And I realized that the, the patient's calculus is different. Um, than a clinician's, and it's so true. So when clinicians talk about side effects and you know the sexy clinical trials readouts and yeah, side effect this, adverse events, AEs or whatever, it's really different when it's your life at stake and you have to do the laundry and you have to take care of your kid and you have all of these things to do and you may not you know, want to take on some of these things that are quality of life issues because it's your math and you know, a, fatigue could be a symptom of another much more serious mm -hmm. adverse event that they are, should know and if they don't then it's up to you but you know you're told that you're it's normal to be tired that's where a caregiver maybe perspective comes in and you're like wait a minute you know i see something changing or not getting better or something like that so yeah, when in doubt, just report it. And if you aren't being heard, I mean, there should be maybe other people on the team, like a clinical trial nurse or you know just a nurse who's sort of more attuned to taking uh, you know calls about side effects or who encourages calls about side effects. But I mean, when in doubt, just report it to make sure that you're doing your own due diligence because you could miss something that will set you back um, if you don't report it. I yeah, guess. and at least from a caregiver standpoint, I think. When a patient tells us a symptom, that should automatically be followed by an open-ended question. So tell me about this fatigue. Because I think in our heads, we hear fatigue and it's like, yeah, I'm fatigued too, but you know, nobody cares, <laughs> nobody asks me. Um, but the fatigue, you're absolutely right. So many times, adrenal insufficiency walks in the door and if you don't ask the right questions, that adrenal insufficiency patient's gonna walk right out the door. Mm -hmm. Thank you, and I am so sorry to have to be the one to end this conversation. Uh, I, I, I'm confident that we could all talk about this for the rest of the afternoon. Um, I'm looking at our panelists, Are you, you're all gonna be sticking around for at least the, the next couple hours? Sure. Yeah. Um, and, and then, um, Dr. Pavlik, if you just wanna do some, some any closing remarks or? or any closing thoughts? Oh, I think I've done enough talking, no? <laughs> <laughs> 
Uh, we are so uh, grateful and appreciative of your time. I don't even like beer. Um, could I ask those on the stage to go in the back and we'll do a quick microphone transfer yep. and then get the next panel sure. up on stage. Thanks everyone. Thank you. Hey, Renee, can you give me a thumbs up when we're about ready? I'd now like to ask. Okay, everybody. Is, is it four, it's four. Can I go? Okay. All right, everybody. I think we're now ready to get started with our next session. To kick us off, I'd now like to bring my friend and colleague, Janine Kelly, Associate Director of Medical Affairs and Patient Advocacy at Merck, to introduce our next panel. Thank you, and thanks to the last panelists for sharing their personal stories. It's really meaningful and helpful. Um, it's an honor to be here today and to work with the team at MRA uh, in their efforts to support patients, their family members, and caregivers. And congratulations to the team at MRA for putting on a fantastic, another fantastic uh, patient forum this year. The next panel discussion will focus on quality of life. Quality of life is a daily concern for patients during cancer treatment. We know that over the last two decades, patient advocates, clinicians, and researchers alike are asking questions and even demand that quality of life become a bigger part of the conversation. This focus on quality of life is good for all of us because at the end of the day, we all want to thrive. We'll hear in the next session about some of the lifestyle factors that help improve the patient experience. You'll learn how things like managing stress, regular exercise, getting enough sleep, 
eating well, et cetera, can have a positive impact. It is my absolute pleasure to introduce the next panel discussion and its first speaker, Dr. Lorenzo Cohen. Thank you for uh, the honor of, of having me here, this panel, this, this very important topic. Uh, we each are gonna speak very briefly, we have a lot more to say than time permits, uh, but we'll blast through uh, a, a lot of slides and then hopefully the majority of the time we'll be able to, to go into conversation. My wife and I wrote this book called Anti-Cancer Living, which focuses on six areas of lifestyle that we know are linked with risk of cancer and influencing outcomes after a diagnosis of cancer. And I won't have time to get into all the science and show you all the data, uh, but encourage you to take a look at that because you can go much deeper and, and see the evidence. It's in multiple languages. I prefer to, to show and not tell, but this morning, this afternoon's talk will be a bit more of the telling. Uh, this uh, book was finished, actually, and I realized this coming here today, on March 8th, 2018. On that same day that I finished the final version and sent it back to the publishers, I was diagnosed with stage three melanoma. And interestingly, that exact same day, I got the email from the MRA saying that I was awarded a grant to study lifestyle and melanoma. On that day, I didn't know I had melanoma because the pathology hadn't come back. I just knew that the cells were malignant. The pathologist actually didn't use the word cancer, even though I work at MD Anderson and been there for over 25 years. And she found it awkward to say, I'm afraid you have cancer. She used that very technical term. So an interesting concept around information. So I underwent uh, neoadjuvant uh, immunotherapy, Ipinevo. This was you know, pre all the data that we've heard just coming out. And it just made sense. We've been doing that in the world of breast cancer for uh, decades. Uh, and, and of course, this is now the new standard of care. So we know how to prevent the majority of cancers in our world, and these same factors, I won't get into all the details, we know will influence outcomes after a diagnosis. Diet, exercise, alcohol, maintaining a healthy weight, and of course, in the case of melanoma, that, that early childhood uh, excessive sun exposure for the majority of melanomas, five, uh, blistering sunburns under the age of 20 it increases the risk of melanoma by 80%. That, that is just a staggering number. And of course, that is why melanoma is expected in, in the next 20 years to become actually the number one cancer in the United States because of individuals in, in my generation that had those exposures who are now uh, after decades, the melanomas are starting to show up. So the key is how do we create an inhospitable environment to cancer growth, even if you have that DNA damage, the mutated cell. And in our cases as patients, how do we create that inhospitable environment to maintain control of cells that uh, are already there? And so in the book, we talk about these six areas. Uh, and I'll only be able to get into two of them in some depth today. Uh, the next speakers will go into much more detail about the exercise component, and I'll focus more on the stress and dying component. What's important to know is that this isn't just about feeling better. All of those factors, in particular uh, stress, diet and exercise influence all the cancer hallmarks, the biological processes that need to be activated to allow that original mutated cell that's happening all the time in our bodies to allow that cell to be able to continue to grow out of control and form a mass and ultimately threaten our lives. So yes, these factors are important for feeling better, but they also impact our biology. Um, and most importantly, 
is that these factors influence each other either positively or negatively. Chronic stress can disrupt our relationships, disrupt our sleep. Lack of sleep influences metabolism and is linked with, with how we process the food in our body. Chronic stress can actually decrease the beneficial effects of healthy food. So the concept of synergy is really important in and around the six areas. So uh, somebody actually used a, a technical term on this last panel, which was the amygdala, the fight or flight response. And although the fight or flight response is really healthy and helpful in the short run, when it becomes chronic, it is extremely damaging. And the stress hormones that are released during the fight or flight response will help you fight or flee, which of course is not what we need to have going on when we're experiencing a chronic unremitting stressor, and in particular a stressor that is threatening our lives. What we know is that stress hormones, in particular norepinephrine and cortisol, can get into the tumor microenvironment and make it more hospitable to cancer growth. And we know that from very elegant animal studies. We know that from patients who experience uncontrolled chronic stress, anxiety, and depression don't do as well. They don't live as long. Individuals who have that stress response blocked either through, through interventions that we'll speak to briefly or even pharmacologically with beta blockers actually do better and live longer. So yes, chronic stress, depression, anxiety are a common reaction to, of course, a life-threatening illness and challenging life situations, but we can manage it and we need to manage it, be able to, again, create this inhospitable environment to cancer growth. Now, it'd be great if it was as easy as, as finding an easier job, a smaller house and a different family, and those of you who have all of those know uh, that that is likely a good prescription, but we can't really write that prescription. But there are so many things that we know from the behavioral perspective, as was alluded to in the last panel, things like cognitive behavioral therapy, um, as well as the more non-conventional approaches that you see listed there, things like yoga, tai chi, qigong. These interventions not only have a tremendous evidence base and are actually on the cancer care guidelines for managing symptoms, but we also know they have an impact on our biology. There was actually a, a very interesting study done uh, quite some time ago, an archival study back in the 90s by Fauzi, Fauzi and colleagues at UCLA, specifically with stage two and three melanoma patients, just a six week cognitive behavioral based group program, and they found better quality of life, mental health symptoms, higher immune function, specifically cell-mediated immunity, which is relevant for controlling uh, melanoma, being an immunogenic cancer. Um, and they found the effects were maintained over six months, and they actually saw survival differences when you compared the intervention to the control group. So these behavioral interventions make you feel better and they may have an impact on longevity. We know things like meditation actually change not only our biology, but even the uh, neuroanatomy, uh, leading to smaller amygdala, larger hippocampus, helping with memory, helping with uh, literally managing the stress in our lives. And it doesn't take long. Studies have shown that even just a 10 minute meditation leads to changes in the epigenetic phenomena, which is what's controlling ultimately our biology. So let's shift really quickly to diet um, and thinking about how we've transformed the food that we eat over the past 50 years or so. It's really not recognizable. Uh, a farm that raises cattle that should be eating grass, they don't eat grass. Uh, the, the pork in our society is, is raised in an extremely unhealthy manner as well as uh, the, the poultry. 
And sugar consumption is also something that's changed dramatically in the past 50 years. And there's clear evidence of a link between excessive sugar, and not just as a refined sugar that's added in foods and actually hidden in foods, but also just the highly refined foods, the high carbohydrate, high glycemic load diet that we know is linked with uh, cancer outcomes. And in this study, uh, epidemiological study where you can see here, um, is there a pointer? There isn't a pointer. Um, that just looking at, at you know, this candy bar and chocolate consumption uh, and, and risk of developing melanoma. Alcohol is a carcinogen. I'm just the messenger here, but it is, it is clear that, that zero is better than one, one is better than two, and the guidelines are going to be rewritten uh, because there is no self -level, safe level of alcohol uh, when we want to reduce our risk of cancer uh, as low as possible. When it comes to diet, it, it's, it's quite simple, although the industry wants to complicate it. Uh, that we just need to eat more legumes, whole grains, nuts, reduce our reliance on animal proteins, in particular red meat, for certain cancer. And you see there uh, what, what the benefit could be. This is uh, data that was just published a couple of weeks ago, uh, looking at uh, response to immunotherapy as it relates to following the Mediterranean diet for patients with melanoma on uh, checkpoint inhibitors. And you see this, this linear relationship. The, the closer their diet was approximating the ideal diet of the, of the Mediterranean diet, the higher the probability you're going to respond to immunotherapy. We know, as I was saying earlier, the diet influences all the cancer hallmarks, uh, and very importantly, the microbiome. And this is the research that MRA funded us for, was actually to look at lifestyle factors as it relates to response to immunotherapy. Um, and then we know the microbiome influences response to immunotherapy. In this paper that we published two years ago, we collected uh, self-report dietary data from patients. We got blood samples, we got the microbiome sample before immunotherapy. Um, I was the PI of the human-based study as well, of course, as, as a participant in my own study once uh, I became a melanoma patient. And what we saw uh, was that the patients who were on a high higher fiber diet had a higher probability of responding to treatment and better survival. What was a bit surprising was actually the patients who did the best in addition to high fiber were ones that were not taking a probiotic. So if they were taking a probiotic, you see on these other curves, it's patients with high fiber who were taking a probiotic. So the probiotic actually negated the beneficial effects of the high fiber diet. I kind of wrote my own personal story in, in this op-ed in the Wall Street Journal, essentially saying that the safest thing we know what to do now to improve the microbiome is to eat a high fiber diet. So am I telling you to become a vegetarian, this one line saying to the other, and trying to eat more vegetarians? No, not necessarily, but the majority of the plate needs to be uh, plant-based, it needs to be whole foods, um, and, and not all of the protein coming from animal sources. This is incredibly healthy plant sources, and these uh, are high in fiber. And all these prebiotics, the foods that feed your microbiome, of course, come from the plant world. And then being cautious about the fermented foods, the probiotic foods, similar to a pill, we don't want to overdo the limited amount of bacteria, healthy al although it is, uh, in, in fermented foods. So some fermented foods is good, lots of these soluble fiber-rich foods. So just to close here, we didn't talk about social support, but that's the critical component. We can get into more details in the discussion to harness your team to, uh, to be there with you, to make changes with you, to support you 
to engage in some type of mind-body practice to decrease that excessive sympathetic nervous system arousal that is natural in this world we live in. And if you do that on a daily basis, you, you create, uh, you sort of turn off the fuel to the tumor microenvironment. Sleep is critical for immune function, important, of course, for immunogenic diseases. We'll hear more about exercise, focus on food, uh, and then be careful about environmental toxins. Harness the benefit of the synergy. So the more you engage in each of the area, the more successful you'll be in each area. And, and this is hard. This is, this is a practice. The more we practice, the better that you get. Thank you. I'm gonna pick it up with exercise, so we're just gonna keep, keep rolling. Um, so my talk is called Movement is Medicine, the Role of Exercise in Melanoma Care. And I wanna talk a little bit about sort of the entire spectrum today from preventing cancer to what to do once you have cancer, and we can go into this in, in some detail today, but happy to chat with anyone as well. So this is not a new concept. This actually dates back to the days of Hippocrates. We knew that exercise, moving your body, is good for you. This wasn't actually formally studied until the 1980s, believe it or not. This was the first dissertation that was ever written on exercise and cancer. It was in 1983, looking at patients with breast cancer getting adjuvant chemotherapy. And the question was actually very simple. Can these patients exercise? So before that time, and actually for many years, including now, after that time, patients were told, you should relax, right? Don't exercise, take it easy, be gentle to your body, all of those types of things, right? This study actually showed that women can exercise, it is safe, and their physical performance is better if they do. Okay? And this is women getting high-dose chemotherapy for neoadjuvant breast cancer. Since I started this at 1985, this is a, just a PubMed search of the words exercise oncology, which is what our field has come to be known as. Um, and you can see this has just taken off exponentially, especially really since the early 2000s. Um, and you heard a little bit in terms of symptom management, but also focusing on cancer outcomes. So I'm gonna talk about both today. Um, so there are consensus guidelines. They're written by both the American College of Sports Medicine and actually within the last year or so, we've seen them make their way into the ASCO guidelines as well. Um, and they are in the NCCN guidelines for symptom management, but not yet for disease control. Um, but that was all done by the American College of Sports Medicine based predominantly on meta-analyses that show that exercise is safe during and after treatment, which was a huge finding, um, and that improvements can be expected in fitness, so your ability just to do the things you want to do. We heard, you know, changing your laundry, getting out of bed. Um, those simple measures of aerobic fitness, quality of life, and fatigue. Um, also, uh, pertinent to this group, though it was studied in breast cancer, that exercise is safe after lymph node surgery and actually can help prevent lymphedema. Patients used to be told it was a cause of lymphedema. So what do we know about exercise? So we know it's good from a symptom perspective. That's not hugely surprising. What about from a cancer outcomes perspective? So if we look at a variety of cancers, as you can imagine, things like breast cancer, colorectal cancer, they're heavily studied. PA here stands for physical activity. We use that term instead of exercise because that includes what you do on a daily basis, your steps on your Apple Watch and all of those types of things. Um, so pre-diagnosis and post-diagnosis, you can see in breast cancer and colorectal cancer, as well as in prostate cancer, you see decreases in cancer-specific and all-cause mortality. That's great. What about melanoma? We have no idea. Right? Um, and essentially, when I started this type of work, this was what we knew, which was not a heck of a lot, um, and we set out to kind of understand what this looks like in the field of melanoma. So I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute, but I wanna talk about the risk of developing cancer first, okay? So 
this is, um, there's not a pointer. You can see a middle dividing line here. Anything to the left of the line means that exercise is good at preventing that type of cancer. Anything to the right of that middle dividing line basically means that exercise could increase the risk or is associated with an increase in risk of developing that type of cancer. So there's a lot of little things here. You can see there's a lot of stuff to the left of the line. Okay, what I'm gonna point out, unfortunately, is that melanoma's to the right of the line. Um, not great, right? This actually suggests that there's an increased risk of melanoma in patients who self-report high physical activity. I get asked this question all the time, which is why I'm talking about it here. Um, and a lot of patients come to me with that face. I, that was my face when I read this paper, too. Um, what they forgot to control for is that people do most of their physical activity outside in the sun. And many people did it before age 20 and got blistering sunburns. Um, and that was not controlled for in this study and has not been controlled for in any study of physical activity and associations with melanoma. And so I don't think there is really an association with increased physical activity, increasing your risk of developing melanoma. I think if you don't wear sunscreen and you spend a lot of time outside, what we already knew is your risk of melanoma goes up. Um, so the memo here, wear sunscreen when you exercise outside, but you should still exercise. Uh, so coming back to this idea of what happens if you actually have a tumor, okay, we, we talked about risk of developing a tumor, but what if you actually already have cancer? As patients, as patient advocates, you wanna know how to help your loved ones, how to help yourselves. So there are numerous ways that I don't have time to go into today in that, that exercise can affect cancer. Um, this is from a review we wrote quite a few years ago now um, of the many mechanisms that exercise could have to affect the tumor. But what I'm gonna tell you is a lot of this starts with our understanding from doing this work in mice, right? And mice are not people, I totally get that. The flip side of that is trying to study this in people is actually very difficult because people who exercise tend to do things like eat better, sleep more, right? Wear sunscreen, do other things, right? Other healthy behaviors. So teasing out the effects of exercise in a person is actually quite difficult, which is why many of us, when we're trying to understand these biological effects, come back to mice, okay? Um, so mouse models of melanoma are actually not new, but mouse studies of exercise in melanoma, pretty new concept, actually. Um, so this paper came out um, when I was a medical oncology fellow. Um, and showed basically if you give a mouse melanoma cells and you give it access to a running wheel and it runs, right, versus sedentary, you just don't give it a wheel, right, the, the tumor volume, so if you inject the same amount of cells at the same time point, the tumors are smaller in the animals that run, okay? Great study, right, fundamental proof of principle. And there's some mechanistic stuff here, science-y words that we don't necessarily need to dive into, but this was shown pretty conclusively. The question really became why is that true and how can we harness that to make our therapies work better? So that was really what I set out to do um, when I was a fellow and a postdoc in Jed Wolchuk's lab at Memorial Sloan Kettering. And this was a very simple study. Basically, you take some mice, you inject them with tumors, you exercise them, or you randomize them to no exercise. We used a treadmill so we could control the amount of exercise, the intensity, all kinds of different things. And then we studied the immune response. So this looks like I'm a mouse personal trainer, and I am, and I should just put that on my CV also, because um, I spent a lot of time running mice on treadmills. Um, but the very simple experiment is give a mouse melanoma, right? Run versus sedentary and see what happens. And if you look here, you can basically see that that lighter blue line, the sedentary mice, they have tumors that are bigger than the mice that exercise. So exactly the same as we saw in that physical activity, the jump on, jump off the wheel, right? We can see in an exercise or training model. Now what happens if I actually take away the immune system? So now I take an immune deficient mouse that does not have a normal immune system. And you can see actually that effect goes away, right? That tells me, this is the definitive experiment that tells me that the immune system is critical to mediating the exercise effects on tumor growth, okay? 
Now, we have a lot of work to do, some of which I have done and ha don't have time to show you today. Um, but to me, this is the, the basis of all that we talk about with exercise, especially in the context of melanoma. It has profound effects on the immune system, and that affects how tumors grow. There are many ways we could think about mechanistically combining this with our other therapies. So obviously, this screams, please combine this with IPI and NEVO and TIL therapy and all those other things that we talk about every day. And trust me, I'm doing that work. Um, but also radiation therapy. Right? If we can improve the blood flow, we know that radiation works better. Things like chemotherapy, which is actually how I started in this field. We can deliver more chemotherapy with exercise. Um, so lots of potential synergy there. Um, but if I want to stand here and write you a prescription for exercise, there's some things that I need to know. How much? Right? How often? The intensity. Do you need to do high intensity interval training? Is going for a walk for 20 minutes sufficient? We, have, we don't know the answers to this. The type of exercise is resistance exercise versus aerobic exercise versus some combination. Is that better? I can't answer that question for you today. Timing. Is it better before treatment, after treatment? Does that not matter? Should you lay off the day of treatment, the week of treatment? Not sure yet. And how do we really then understand this well enough to combine this with our therapies? And so this is a lot of, you know, we want to think of exercise as medicine, and I tell all my patients to exercise. I recognize some faces in the room. You've all heard me say this. Um, but if we want to be able to prescribe exercise, these are the things that we need to understand. And this is a lot of what I spend my time working on. So if you are a patient, a patient advocate, how do you learn more? How do you find programs like this near you that can help uh, walk cancer patients through exercise? So this is the best website that I know of. It's called Exercise is Medicine. It is put on by the American College of Sports Medicine. It will literally link you to exercise rehab programs for oncology patients in your area. You search by zip code. Um, so check it out if you're interested. Um, with that, um, I will say thank you, and we'll answer some questions at the end. Uh, good, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for coming today. Uh, my name is Alexander Woodkowski. I'm coming from Portland, Oregon. I'm a dermatologist at Oregon Health and Sciences University. Today I'm going to talk about non-invasive imaging tools that help us uh, both clinicians and patients and survivors to improve precision in early melanoma diagnosis. These are my conflicts of interest. Uh, and first of all, I have three special thanks today. The first one is to Melanoma Research Alliance for inviting me here today and also allowing uh, us to donate uh, the devices that you may have all seen inside of your bags today. I also want to thank my first mentor, Professor Giovanni Pellicani, and I think uh, the quote that he told me on the first day of work really symbolizes one of the ways that I approach my patients. So the only guaranteed treatment of melanoma is its earliest detection and it's complete removal. We have all the tools, we just need to use them. The, sec the third thanks I wanna give um, is to Professor Sansi Leachman, who is my mentor and the chairwoman at Oregon Health and Sciences University. And I think that that statement that Sansi says almost every day, if you see something, say something, and then do something. <laughs> so going into my short talk, if we think about melanoma, it starts from a very small size. And then in its progression, it becomes visible to the clinician and to the patient at different stages. We have different tools that can help us to identify melanoma at its different progressive steps. The three main tools that we use in a clinician's office are dermoscopy from the left. Uh, we have options such as a 3GEP sticker biopsy that looks at genetics. Uh, we also have a reflectance confocal microscope that allows us to look and perform a painless virtual biopsy of the skin live at the bedside, kind of like a virtual pathologist. It actually lets us look at the individual cells. 
Uh, and then you can see here in the progression which tool fits in which position. So at this time, the reflectance confocal microscope allows us, because we can see the cells, we can identify tumors at their very, very early stages, as you'll learn today. These are really the take-home points that I really want to stress if you take something from my talk. So patients, partners, family, and friends identify over 50% of skin cancers. So melanoma is like a calligraphic ink and not a pretty one, but it's written on the skin for somebody to see. And really the first people that see it are you as survivors, you the patients who have the lesion on your skin. Whether you see it or somebody in your vicinity, it's important to see it and then say something. Uh, there is a limited access to dermatology providers. The average wait during the pandemic was between 9 to 12 months. Now it's about 3 to 6 months, even for some patients who are, who are established. Um, it's important to know that patients and survivors are capable of engaging in their own health and using tools to help self-triage even sooner than they were doing before. Clinicians can improve communication with their pathologists. I'll show that in my talk. And then uh, I would like to present a unique technique that we established in Oregon called confocal ink stain biopsy uh, that I think we can really expand um, and scale within the medical community because it's a very simple technique to reduce pathology sampling bias, which ultimately re results in improved precision. And then I, I went a little bit too fast. Follow your own intuition as a patient and then follow your instinct as a clinician. And the rest of my presentation will be examples of that. So three cases. The first one was a patient at the time, 27-year-old female. Uh, in San Francisco, she was three months pregnant. Um, and she identified a lesion, or her partner identified on her left scapula on the left part of her back. And she went to a primary care physician and asked, what do you think about this lesion? And her report to me is that the primary care uh, family doctor said that, well, it doesn't look good, it doesn't look bad. I think you should get a second opinion. And so that was the official recommendation from a dermatology provider. And so when she started calling in March of 2020, when the pandemic started in San Francisco, the response was, we can't see you for six months, nine months. She was in transit moving to Portland, Oregon, had called over 10 locations, including ours, and we were bombarded with uh, requests and the inability to uh, uh, see the patients due to staffing issues and to the COVID restrictions. And so the patient had this instinct that something is wrong and she didn't take no for an answer. And so she went on to our favorite search engine, Google, and she looked up on Google, Portland, is this melanoma? And so she found a program that Dr. Leachman and I started with our team uh, where we lend out these devices as part of an e-visit. And so the first time I met the patient was when she submitted a photo from her kitchen, as you see here. So a medical grade image, exactly what I use to diagnose and triage my own patients, the patient submitted to us in an e-visit. And we have the three hallmark concerning features. So when I saw this lesion, I said, I need to see you immediately, and I invited the patient the next day with the anticipation, of course, to perform a biopsy. Before I performed the physical biopsy, I used a confocal microscope. This is the virtual biopsy I was talking about. The principle, it works, it creates bagel sections of the skin non-invasively, so we attach it to the skin. It takes very quick photos in about one to two minutes, and we can see the cellular level at different, sorry, cellular level view at the different levels of the skin. So we can diagnose melanoma, basal cell, and squamous cell carcinoma. And you can see its comparison to pathology on the right side. And the actual size of the device in my hand, it's quite small, so it can move from room to room. And so I performed that virtual biopsy. And if we look in detail, we can actually see individual cells. I can see down to one cell, one nucleus. So what I was seeing here was a lot of atypical, we call it pleomorphic uh, uh, nucleated cells, which represent atypical melanocytes. The architecture is very disrupted. So from the dermoscopic image and the confocal presentation, for me, was an absolute melanoma in situ, at least maybe severely dysplastic. So I removed the lesion, and I received an initial diagnosis that it was a compound nevus atypical type. What that means is that it's not absolutely okay, and it's not absolutely bad. It's somewhere in the gray zone. For me, this is in the light gray zone. And so because I was very concerned, I was thinking this is in the darker gray, black would be melanoma, if we think like a scale of how we grade lesions. 
And so there was a mismatch between what I was seeing and what the pathologist reported to me as the clinician. So this is where you as a clinician follow your gut instinct. If it doesn't seem like you're matching, ask questions, call, ask to do additional tests. So we did, oh, I'll get to that in a second. And so the reason for that is because the pathology diagnosis dictates the way we manage the patient. So you can see here, if I were to go purely based on the initial result, I have five or six different options how I can manage this patient. Which one is the correct one? Ultimately, it's my job and my responsibility to do what is best for the patient. So I asked for additional tests. We did some genetic expression profile, ancillary tests. That being positive led to additional staining tests that were done. And ultimately, upon reevaluation after clinician instinct and request to really check it again, it was called a melanoma in situ. And so from the very beginning, this patient had a melanoma in situ. It just was not observed due to some sampling bias, which can be improved by confocal microscopy. So ultimately, the correct way to manage the patient is to perform a wide excision and then uh, call it, I would say, end of story period in that sense because an insight to melanoma chances of metastasis are close to zero uh, or basically none, especially when you're doing a five millimeter margin excision. So this is important because it, it influences the way we manage the patients. So we create our own workflow, which is in publication now. We're tracking patients over two years now within our group and seeing how they're doing to date. Using these tests and using this methodology, none of the patients have had any recurrences. The second case is to highlight scarring. So there's also a psychological aspect to melanoma survivors and those persons who have not had melanoma, uh, but have been succumbed to having a lot, a lot of physical biopsies. And so this is the presentation I received only a few, uh, two weeks ago. And you can see four lesions sent to me by another provider uh, dermoscopy photos, all of them are concerning based on dermoscopy. So if you don't have access to the sticker uh, evaluation test, the 3GEP adhesive sticker, or you don't have access to confocal, technically you need to biopsy physically all four of them. But which one of those is actually the melanoma and which ones are not? And so we can use it, the confocal, and we did that. And you can see, and I'll present in a moment, that only one of the lesions had atypical cells. The rest of them were absolutely OK uh, um, and did not present with any atypical features. And so because of that, we can actually reduce invasive biopsies considerably in our setting by at least 50% for this patient, 75% reduction with the same safety and effectiveness as traditional methods. And this has been uh, researched and published and tracked for over 10 years, mostly in Europe, but there are several centers that are doing this in the US. Oregon is the first one in the Northwest. And so coming to the fourth lesion for that patient, the one that had atypical cells, we can see the dermoscopy photo here. But if I go and do a biopsy, is every single piece of this tissue that's presented to the pathologist a melanoma? Well, the answer is bifold or binary. Yes, if it's a full-blown melanoma, there's an unequivocal, without a doubt, a melanoma. But if it's an early melanoma, which is our ultimate goal, find it early because that is the true cure. Where is the melanoma starting in this lesion? Well, we won't know unless we actually see the cells at this bagel sectioning view from above. And so we did that. That square represents the surface area I could see with confocal. This is just a piece of that area. And we, we saw atypical cells with nuclei only in specific sections, so precise that we actually know exactly where the cells are. So that's one extra level of information. The second one is the one that we provide to our dermatopathologist. So we actually mark, and our team, uh, uh, we started this technique, we were the first to publish this. So we actually mark the lesion with a special ink, and then we it adheres to the skin with FDA quality vinegar, let's say, but a special, a special spray. Um, and then we send it to pathology. So when they make the slides, they actually look first in the areas that we marked yellow. And then this is the, the publication that we had. And that particular case came back as a melanoma. And so that's important that we use this tool to be more precise. 
The third and final case uh, is to show how precise can we be with the current tools in our armory. And so this patient, 60-year-old female, came for a neck up exam. I identified this very, very small, like literally ballpoint pen. You just touch the skin. This little uh, black dot, we call it a darker pigmented macule. Um, and so I saw, this is the dermoscopy photo on the left, and I told the patient, you will think I'm crazy. I think it's the smallest melanoma ever. And this is after I've read the publications, worked on a couple, on, I'm familiar with all the textbooks. I have not seen anything smaller. The reason I said that is because its dermoscopic presentation was not of a benign nature. It has this pigment around the one little pore on the left. So I did confocal microscopy. That's the virtual biopsy on the right in black and white. And we see lots of bright, reflective white cells that are aggregating or gluing to one pore on the skin. And so I biopsied the lesion completely to make sure that for patient safety. And I received an initial result that it's absolutely OK. And there wasn't even one mention of the word atypia. I'm not suggesting that the pathologist did something wrong. I'm trying to show where there are limitations in pathology and early diagnosis of skin cancers and where tools like the virtual biopsy, genetic expression profile testing, whether they're uh, in the setting of non-invasive, so um, uh, in vivo testing can give us that extra level of information if we have discordance. And so I followed my judgment. I asked questions. I said, please order more tests. And so that was done, a multitude of uh, different tests. So genetic expression profile diagnostic tests, special staining, and ultimately the lesion, only once in my life have I ever seen the word major discrepancy, was that this was actually a melanoma in situ. So, a correct and precise diagnosis. It finally was published on PubMed in January of this year. And then a special thanks to our entire team, especially Sansi. Uh, not only were we peer reviewed and validated for this lesion, but also the Guinness World Records is coming out this <laughs> month for uh, smallest melanoma and smallest skin cancer detected to date. Now, I'm not saying, although, as a survivor, I think that you would like to hear that, but it's difficult to say, hey, everybody go look for these pinpoint lesions. But I'll be honest, if we found everything that small, or in general, at the in situ stage, we would reduce mortality almost completely. Because again, the cure is early diagnosis. Now, people fall through the cracks. That's why we need to have all of this support from treatment uh, uh, that we're talking about today. But ultimately, long-term goal is to totally prevent it through early detection. Uh, so what are our next steps? Just the tail end of my talk here. Um, uh, we developed artificial intelligence that received FDA breakthrough designation status, and we're finishing clinical trials at multiple sites um, in the United States to have a triage that's very accurate, a triage, not diagnosis, triage uh, in under five seconds. So we'll pr provide updates to, the, to everybody here as that becomes uh, more public information, but just to show you that this is something that a physician's assistant can use, somebody who hasn't had five years of training in dermoscopy like I have or our colleagues, or somebody who just finished school and wants a supplemental tool, this is something that our institution is working on to bring to the public. So summarizing, what, are, what is my mission and what it should be our mission? It is to catch the inevitable early with what I call the three Ps. So that's passion, which you can't fake it, prevention, and precision. And we have all of the ingredients to do this together. So I hope that this information uh, will be of benefit to the audience. And of course, anybody can do dermoscopy, even my own little uh, two-year-old son, Piat. So <laughs> thank you very much for your attention. Stress, sleep, exercise, the diet, great community, all these things, including a great set of doctors who know what they're looking out for. My name is Bill Evans, and I am a husband, father of two grown-up children, a fourth grade teacher. Um, I'm a competitive cyclist. And three years ago, I, was, uh, I had a 
lymph node that needed to be checked out. No point of origin, but I have cancer, metastatic melanoma. And so as a data-driven cyclist, um, I had been in for 30 years in various cycling disciplines. Um, I know that if at 53 I need to compete with the young 20-year-old neopros, which I still am doing, um, that I need data. And so that is what I've always been doing uh, over the past years and all the way through my cancer journey and continuing on. Um, well, I check every day my sleep. Um, everything that these fine people have talked about, this <coughs> is the center of my universe right here. And so uh, I'm so fortunate to be here to talk to you a little bit and to answer your questions. But I'm um, uh, basically at UVA uh, off and on getting my scans done. Um, I went in luckily right at the beginning of COVID three years ago, actually exactly three years ago. And um, basically the oncologist in, in Fredericksburg said it's time to go to a center. And so everybody was shutting down for COVID, everybody. And so UVA had a kind of a door that was open and I jumped right on through there. And so it was love at first sight and um, immediately they, uh, decided that a, a radical neck dissection was the first step. And so from then, I did uh, 13 months of, of immunotherapy, Nevo. And I started getting back into the exercise a little bit at a time. Um, I'm looking for data. How much am I allowed to do 10 to 15 hours on the bike? Am I allowed to do strength training? Can I lift more than 10 pounds? Uh, all of this, I was trying to search for answers. Um, it was pretty lonely. It's hard. There isn't a ton of data out there that I was able to uh, get. Now, it's just amazing how much uh, that I'm finding now. But um, it was a really difficult time um, trying to figure out how much I can do during my therapy, particularly. Um, I would basically not feel well, fatigue, all of the things that, the rashes, um, you know, all of that happening. And then slowly I would be able to get into my cycling discipline and where's the intensity? Is it too much, too little? Um, what can get me back on, on the race course? Um, and so I found a balance. Actually the balance found me whenever I was able to overreach just a little bit. And it took me months and months to start to figure out where my breaking points were. Um, but it was always from, you know, I, I got a special ring that is a sleep tracker, heart rate variability, resting heart rate, to make sure that I was squared away when I got up in the morning. The diet, always squared away, whole foods, you named it. Um, you know, more green juice than, than probably is okay. Um, <laughs> um, not sponsored. And, um, but anyway, uh, this and then choosing the right time of day. I, I, had a great dermat I have a great dermatologist um, at UVA who said, um, if you're doing four hour bike rides, go from eight to 10, come home, go back out late, 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 and get the other hours in. And so I started to do that. Um, every suntan lotion, every sunscreen, um, I, I had it all. I've tried it all. It all ends up in my socks at the end of it all anyway. <laughs> but um, anyway, this has been uh, an, an amazing journey. Um, I'm here if you have any questions about um, what are the possibilities. That's, that's, that's why I'm here. No slides. <laughs> Nobody ever wants to see people throwing themselves around a four corner bike race, NASCAR style. Um, but anyway, thank you. All right, and one of the things that I, I hate about this job is I have to be a little bit of a timekeeper. So, so we are running a little bit behind, but I think we have time for two or three quick questions. And I saw the first hand over here. Um, so thank you very much, Bill, for sharing your story. Um, I was 
And I also wanted to ask um, Dr. Warner this question too, uh, based on the data that you, and the research that you've done. So um, I was also very active, I was a runner. I was running um, not a huge amount, I mean not crazy, but probably 10 to 15 miles a week. And uh, I um, had zero symptoms of a five centimeter tumor in my right lobe until I developed post-obstructive pneumonia and actually went to the ER for pain. So I, my question was firstly to Bill, as an athlete, um, did you have any other symptoms, just a swollen lymph node? Um, and my question also so to Dr. Warner is, my own theory, and I'm an N of one, but maybe Bill can join me in this theory, is that if you do have an, you know, if you are pretty athletic and you have a low heart rate, um, what I realized afterwards, right, was that my heart rate had slowly been increasing from like 45 to 50 to 55 to 60. And it was like my heart was compensating for um, the lack of oxygen from my lungs. And, but I didn't know that was happening. And I wonder if there's almost like a downside to exercise in, in delaying diagnosis because you don't develop symptoms as quickly, your body's more able to compensate. Um, not that I don't exercise now. I, at three months post my upper and middle low back to me, I ran a 5K. But <laughs> um, so I, I think it's a great question, one that we don't have all of the answers to yet. Um, I think there are very mixed data in people who exercise, and particularly higher level athletes like Bill. Um, about diagnosis. Some are so in tune with their body that they actually do notice mm -hmm. the two to three beats faster of their heart rate and they actually are picking that up, you know, whether it's through an activity tracker or just, you know, athletes at that level really can tell the difference between a heart rate of 49 and 52. Um, and then the other end of the spectrum, which I think I probably was when I was a division one athlete, which was my body hurts all the time and I ignore everything. Um, so I, the data are quite mixed um, about sort of time to diagnosis based on physical activity. There are undoubtedly symptoms based on where a tumor presents things like, you know, a lung or a mediastinal mass can certainly increase heart rate and other things. Um, but it's so individual, it's really hard to put the data together. And so um, I, I think what I, tell everyone, um, and, and we've heard this as a theme throughout the day, is you, know, you have to trust your instinct, you have to trust your body. If something seems not right, you need to, you need to talk to someone about it. If I can jump in, I mean, the, the, the data that I was using uh, just prior to my diagnosis three years ago, um, power meter on a bicycle, which is produced in wattage, watts, um, the metrics with my heart rate, my, my, my resting heart rate, all of those things, there, there wasn't anything I, I was involved in. Of course, if you're involved in bike racing, you're crashing a lot. Um, and not because you're bad, but just because it's uh, 80 other people throwing themselves around. Um, but um, I didn't heal very quickly. Um, but then about a month before, my uh, functional threshold power had dropped about 12 to 15 percent. And so um, that was kind of my first sign that something wasn't right. But again, um, I was we were transitioning. The school had just shut down because of COVID, and so I wasn't quite getting all the rides in that I, so I attributed it to a lot of things because we could easily be in denial as athletes too. Um, but I did sense that. And since then, um, looking at my, like if I would get in, one of my Nevo infusions, um, resting heart rate through the roof, um, you know, for, for about four or five days afterwards, heart rate variability drops all the way down. For me, dropping down into 20 to 25, um, which is the span between the beats. Um, and then the, the fatigue, which was just, uh, you know, but, um, and then now after, uh, sky's the limit. I think one of the advantages of people wearing, you know, Apple Watches, activity trackers, you name it, um, it, it is this, this 
congregation of data that we're starting to get. Um, so I've done some work with a company called Whoop that is an activity tracker um, that measures things like heart rate variability. And I figured out, you know, four days before I got COVID that I had COVID. Mm -hmm. I didn't know what I didn't know what I had, but I knew I had something. Yeah. Um, and you know, I am a full-time doctor, so feeling tired. You know, I'm a full-time doctor and a full-time researcher. I feeling tired is my everyday life, so that wasn't um, you know a sign that I was going to notice. Um, but you know, my my activity tracker actually was like, hey, there's something up, right? And thankfully, you know. In the grand scheme, it was just COVID, and I was really sick for a week. Um, but I do think we're going to start to see more of that as more and more people are wearing activity trackers. And a lot of us are working with the data from you know, some of these activity trackers. So you know, when they ask you if you have an Apple Watch or other things, if you want to opt in, it's actually super helpful to researchers like me um, to, to do that. And it's obviously anonymized data. Um, I just wanted to follow up on that. Actually, my question is about tracking inflammation and using HRV. I also have an aura ring. I have a bio strap, not the whoop strap, but maybe I'll get one too. <laughs> and I work with a, uh, a group of biohackers because that's a, something I'm interested in who um, have their own algorithm uh, to track inflammation. And they work with various types of um, patients and they did their research on COVID patients specifically. So uh, my, my question is to Dr. Warner and, and Bill, I guess maybe you could weigh in about using inflammation as a marker to guide how much exercise to do, especially when it comes to endurance exercise that increases inflammation more than HIIT and resistance training. Uh, but you still need that. So is, is inflammation a marker that one could be using? Can wearables uh, track that? Because there are great differences between Aura and Whoop and Biostrap in terms of HRV, but is there an algorithm out there that you guys like to use that you see coming down the pipeline, specifically using inflammation as a tracker to help guide this research? It's a fantastic question. Um, I think you're five years ahead of where we are mm -hmm. um, in terms of these are questions that we're answering or we're asking. We don't necessarily have all the answers to that yet. Um, inflammation does not directly correlate with HRV. Um, in, it's not a sort of a direct linear relationship, so we can't necessarily just extrapolate that way. Many of us were hoping it would be something that simple, um, and it, it turns out that it's not. Um, and as we know, right, in the melanoma world, some inflammation can be good and can treat your cancer, and some inflammation can be bad. Um, and so where, where do those you know, levels lie, and how does that factor into an algorithm? Lots of really smart people, including yourself, working on this. Um, but I, we don't, don't have answers yet, but they're, they're questions that a lot of us are working on, for sure. And I am so, so sorry, everyone. Um, I'm looking at our panelists. Are, are you all able to join us for the reception and what afterwards? So I highly encourage you, if you have additional questions, to go up. Um, this is the worst part of this job, is cutting off good conversation, <laughs> uh, particularly when we have brilliant folks who, uh, you know, clearly there's a ton of interest. But uh, just as a quick update, we are a little behind schedule, but I'm hoping that if you all are willing to give me 10 minutes extra, we'll, we'll all be on track, and then we'll get you to the reception uh, with no problem, okay? So uh, on our, uh, so let's give a hand to, the, to this panel, and we'll swap out microphones. Thank you all so very much. Uh, when we started to plan out our goals, the content, and then the speakers, we wanted to showcase uh, for this patient forum, our, um, our minds immediately went to all of the great science candy. At MRA, we get very excited by, by good research and, and strong outcomes and uh, associations and et cetera, et cetera. However, it's also really important that we never forget the incredible experience that's in this very room. Uh, that comes directly from the melanoma community itself and its patients, its survivors, and its caregivers. It's these people and their insight that we'll be exploring together during this, our final panel together. Uh, and with that, I would like to invite our panel to um, make their way up here. I know we're still working on some microphones, but I think uh, Dr. Levy, MRA's Chief Science Officer, uh, could also uh, kick us off. Sure. 
Okay, could everyone hear me? Great. So I am Joan Levy, I'm Chief Science Officer at the MRA, and I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, you know, as CSO and part of the research team, it's really such a great opportunity to be with patients and caregivers, and Cody knows, I said, this year I am making it to the patient forum and being part of it in some way. So I'm really thrilled to be here. Um, really the goal of this concluding panel is to help patients and caregivers have a better understanding of living with melanoma through the experience of others, other patients and other caregivers. So joining me, and maybe I'll sit right now, are two patients, um, David Marks and Ken Billet. They actually have two very different types of melanoma. And to the left of me is um, Pat Janiak, who is a caregiver to a loved one with melanoma. So welcome, everyone. And what I thought of doing is to start off this with some introductions by each panelist. Two to three minutes introducing yourself, your diagnosis. Um, part of your patient journey, remember you don't have to say it all in the first two to three minutes because I'll be asking you a lot of questions and you'll be able to fill in. So how about if we have Ken start off? Okay, good afternoon. I'm, I'm Ken Billet. Uh, I am a st current stage four melanoma patient, uh, but I am also not under treatment. I finished my protocol uh, two years of immunotherapy back in October of 2022. Uh, my journey started, uh, stage four journey started uh, about 10 years ago, uh, previously biopsied lesion, uh, metastasized, I had that removed in, uh, again in 2011, um, which was stage 2B. Uh, two years later, a PET scan showed that I had uh, active uh, metastases in both of my lungs. Um, interesting piece of that is the biomarker testing showed that I had a CKIT mutation. So I actually started a targeted therapy at that point. And for the next seven years, my tumors remain relatively small and stable. Um, as a couple of people mentioned, uh, Bill, a moment ago to, about uh, the uh, pandemic. In June of 2020, I had a spot showing up around my right adrenal gland. Uh, and then that started another part of my journey where I uh, began immunotherapy, as I mentioned a moment ago. Uh, so I am very uh, fortunate to still be here, very fortunate that I was able to tolerate all of my treatments with relatively a uh, very minimal amount of, uh, of um, problems and issues and side effects. And uh, so happy to share whatever information I can share. Thank you. How about if we go to Pat and to describe, you know, her experience being a caregiver? Not on. I don't know which one. Is this one? Yeah. I think we might just have to pass that. Technical difficulties again. Story of my life. All right. Um, my husband, John, was diagnosed in 2019 with anal rectal mucosal, mucosal melanoma. And we live in Plymouth, Mass. We are close to Boston, so off we were to Mass General Hospital, which has been our lifesaver. Um, I have been his caregiver, his patient advocate during this time. The journey has not been easy. I will be the first one to admit that. Um, he had two surgeries. They couldn't extract everything. Um, he's had cisplatin and temidor chemotherapy. He then 
almost a year later had a recurrence and they did ipinevo immunotherapy. Stopped that after three um, treatments and the next month he had, he was getting confused and he had a car accident and he didn't know who he was, where he was, whatever. And after a week at our local hospital and at a nursing home, we immediately took him back to Boston and he was diagnosed with immunotherapy-induced encephalitis, which is the rarest of the side effects. So after 78 days in the hospital in rehab, he had to learn how to walk and do many things all again. Um, but today, he is still here and we are continuing this journey. In addition, he had two brain mets in the past two years and has had two craniotomies, so um, the story is long. But anyways, the bottom line is, is that being a caregiver is not an easy job, but it's a very rewarding job. And I'll give you some more insights into how to deal with it later. Quite a story. And for those of you who don't know, mucosal melanoma is a very rare subtype. It occurs in about a few thousand, you know, 2,000 people in the U.S. are diagnosed each year from it. So we're going to hear about a patient now who has another rare subtype. I feel more comfortable standing up. Uh, my name is David Marks. I'm from Chevy Chase, Maryland. My doctor, Dr. Atkins, is in the audience. And a little bit of advice for him. He was talking about a movie with Tom Hanks. I would pick Tom Cruise, Dr. Atkins. <laughs> there is no such thing as a bad day. Um, just it didn't work out to your expectations. My journey is that I had retired at 75, which was five years ago, came home at night, took my shoes and socks off to go to bed. My hand was full of blood. I had a tumor underneath my little toe. That night, I took care of that. The next morning, went to the local podiatrist who, made an, who I made an appointment with but he had an emergency at a local hospital. He said, take a picture of what you want me to see and I will call you back. Call me back in 15 minutes and it happened to be a Saturday. He said, I'll see you at eight o'clock on Sunday morning. My wife and I went to see the doctor and within 10 minutes, he said, this is melanoma. At that particular point in time, here I am sitting across the desk from the doctor. He says, you have melanoma. What do you do now? I was really, really shaken like a lot of you are in this room when you got that diagnosis. So what did I do? My wife and I put together, um, we had, Linda had gone to Georgetown Hospital. We called our doctor there and he put us in touch with Dr. Atkins. Dr. Atkins immediately put a team together of a oncology surgeon, a plastic surgeon. Within two weeks, my toe was removed. It had gone to my lymph nodes. The infected lymph nodes were removed. I was home that night. Five weeks later, I started treatment. Um, it was Nevo. Everything went great for the first year. Then I wasn't feeling well. There was a woman in the audience talking about being tired. Um, I went to see Dr. Atkins, and what did he do? He put me in the emergency room. I had type 1 diabetes. The treatment had shut down my pancreas and killed all of the beta cells in my pancreas. Dr. Atkins was extremely gentle, knew exactly what he was doing, put a whole team together, and we followed it. And I did ask a lot of questions. Linda was my advocate going through all of this. We got through it. 
And my last appointment with Dr. Atkins was on Valentine's Day of this year. It's five years, and there's no evidence of disease progression. Well, such enlightening stories. Um, and, you know, maybe for those of you who don't know what acromelanoma is, it occurs on um, the palms of your hands, the soles of your feet, um, under your nail beds, in the non-sun exposed areas of the body. So, um, anyway, what I now wanted to say is when, you know, from what I've heard, when and obvious when patients are diagnosed with any cancer, it's, as you know, totally overwhelming, not only for the patient, but also for the caregivers and loved ones. And sometimes I've heard they kind of, you know, some patients have told me they feel like they can't get out of bed for a while, and, but then there's something that motivates them to get back on their feet. So, you know, perhaps, Ken, you could describe what it was like for you, and, and what was that inertia that helped you get moving? Um, when I was first diagnosed, uh, when the doctor oncologist came in the room, told us what was going on, and said that if we don't get you in a clinical trial, you might be, you might be dead in nine to 12 months. And my wife visibly gasped. And I was, Basically, uh, it was a surreal experience. I wandered out, we checked out, went home. Um, I will be perfectly honest, that is the first and only time I cried over my diagnosis. And that morning, the following morning, excuse me, is when I said, okay, we're gonna get to work. Um, I'm a realistic person, a pragmatic person, uh, I'm not a Superman. Uh, I don't compete in bike races, and you know. And I also, by the way, do not eat a very healthy diet either. So, um, <laughs> at least so, you're admitting that. At least That's I'm good. admitting that. Yeah, yeah. Um, but in in that regard, that was when I said, okay, we we need to get to work. We, meaning my wife and I, uh, and we talk about uh, Pat talking about being a caregiver. My, my wife is my rock. And I don't say that just because this is being recorded and she'll see this at some point. Uh, but she is my rock. She is, she is the one that muscles through everything. And that's what I was sad about, what was, what was going to happen to my kids, what was going to happen to her. And uh, also, because this was back in 2013, I told my family, get off the Internet. I said, things have changed. Uh, the, you know, the, everything was moving forward with immunotherapies and other trials and so on. And I said, stop looking at those three and five and 10 year survival rates. I said, I said, we need to start working forward. And again, when I talk about fortunate, it's also my biomarker, uh, having a C-kit mutation, knowing that there were other treatment options available to me, even though it was a rare piece to that. Uh, but again, to answer your question, uh, we just simply got to work, not, not not that that's a, 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 a uh, whatever you want to call it, the, the way that everyone else handles it. Everybody deals with this individually and how they work their way through it. But I'm just the type of person that just give me a problem and I'm going to go try to solve it. Yeah, that's great. David, what do you have to add to that? I believe that um, your attitude plays a huge role in your survival. Um, I, in business, I um, listen to motivational tapes all the time, um, going back and forth in the, in the car before we had satellite radio and everything, and I'm convinced that attitude is everything when it comes to melanoma or any other type of cancer. It's all going to work out. There is no such thing as a bad day. It just didn't meet your expectations. And I went through the whole five years with that attitude and um, still have a very positive attitude and just continue to do that. Thanks. And, and Pat, as a caregiver, I'm, I'm sure it was really, really tough. So what got you going? 
Well, I think it got me going is that John had the will to live. No matter what we heard, he was willing to go through whatever he had to go through. Um, mainly for our three grandchildren that live north of San Francisco, so he it was trips out there that kept him going and, and whatever. But I don't think the journey was what he expected, obviously, from what I've said. And I think if I could t tell anybody and suggest to anybody is ask questions. Um, our oncologist and their team were great. But when we got to the encephalitis part of it, I have to be honest, they actually said that they were learning with us. It was so rare and immunotherapy was so new that there was no history. There, there, we, knew, we, we didn't know what the outcome would be. But I also caution people as caregivers that sometimes we can get too involved and we don't take time for ourselves. And that's the one thing I wanted to impress upon everybody today, that you know you have to balance it out because the caregiver is, you know, the patient's going through everything, but the caregiver has to keep everything going. And so you need to find time for you. You need to find time to be able to relax to get out of the house, to be somewhere else, and walk, meditate. I'm a Reiki master teacher. I have to say Reiki's been a big help to me throughout these five years. Um, but we all have to get involved in something. Yeah. Definitely. definitely. Can you? No, yeah, definitely. Um, you have to. To say it that way, that's what I wanted to make sure also to say at one point, is that you have to be good to yourself. Uh, as, as both the patient and as caregivers, you have to be good to yourself. Find something to get involved with, is like right. you said. Yeah. To get John more involved, though, I yeah. actually got a puppy in 2020. <laughs> <laughs> and he so gets you had to another, walk the you puppy. had a child in the house. I had yeah, a child in the go. house, and we have a puppy that he walks four <laughs> times a day. There you go. Well, there are bringing in the exercise, right? Great animals strategy. Are great. Animals are great. Like yeah. yeah. Pets are great. Like that. Oh, sure. I also believe that it's a lot tougher sometimes on the caregiver than it is on the patient um, because you have a tendency to, as a caregiver to let your mind get out of control and um, you have to be able to control the emotions that are attached to that. Um, every time that I went to see Dr. Atkins, I brought my wife Linda with me because I felt that four years were better than two and I might not be paying attention or she might not be paying attention. During COVID, I had a, a very interesting experience since she was my advocate. I go to check in at the Lombardi Cancer Center, which is Georgetown, and the guard says, um, I'm sorry, you can't bring anybody in for your appointment. And I said, well, she's my advocate. She has been for the last two and a half to three years. And, and this was during COVID and this was two and a half years ago. And, she, and the guard said, I'm sorry, you can't do that. So I said, okay, you're making her work out, wait outside in the parking lot. Then what I'm gonna do, I'm gonna go in and ask Dr. Atkins if we can have an appointment out in the parking lot. He never, he never heard that story, and all of a sudden, we both got in to see Dr. Atkins. <laughs> good for you. Thank you. <laughs> really good for you. Your own Absolutely. Yeah. That's the recurrent theme here, that patients and caregivers have to be advocates. Um, it's so important. So, you know, um, David just brought up that sometimes our... Um, healthcare facilities can be a little bit challenging to maneuver and deal with. Um, so he provided an example of how he o overcame, you know, one particular obstacle. What, I mean, Pat, Ken, whoever wants to go first, what, what challenges have you encountered and how have you been able to overcome them? So when we've had emergencies, John has to go to our local hospital by ambulance. And so, um, the local hospital 
can't deal with his diagnosis. They say that it's above what they're able to do, but they don't really do anything to foster us getting out of the hospital. So I think that the biggest thing for me was that when, our, when we talked to the oncologist in Boston, on a Friday night, he said, I've talked to them, I've told them what they have to do, and here is my personal cell number that I trust you with, Pat, and if this doesn't happen, you call me and I'll make sure that it happens. And little did I know that he was going on vacation the next day, but he was willing to take our phone call. So that was awesome. You know, um, we all need an oncologist like that. And the staff has been, the staff has been always been great. So whenever we've had an issue, we've just worked it through. You know, I'm not afraid to ask the questions. I'd rather ask a question than not ask a question. I was brought up that there was no stupid questions. You took the words right out of my mouth, because, you know, I was going to say there absolutely is no stupid question to if ask. Anything on your mind, right. you should ask. And if you right. don't ask, you don't know. Exactly. Yeah, the prior, um, or one of the prior presentations, they had the uh, slide that had uh, asking questions. Remember, we were talking about that at the table. And that's a perfect example of what everyone should do. Bring somebody with you. Bring, bring a sheet of paper, your computer, your tablet, what have you. Ask those questions. Have that other set of ears and eyes that are with you. Um, and I think same thing, just ask. My team uh, gets very tired of me asking all the questions all the time about my oncology team, you right. know, politely, but they, they know that I'm going to wear them out after a while. I do that all the time. <laughs> I mean, I'll share this quick story with you. My husband had to go to his primary care physician about a month ago, and it was a day that I couldn't go. And so I sent him by Uber to his appointment. And when he got home, he said, well, Dr. J wanted to know where you were. And I said, and he said, I told him that you couldn't come. And he said, phew, I don't have to be on my A game today. <laughs> <laughs> and John said, would you explain that? And he said, your wife asks great questions, but I always have to be prepared. <laughs> I'm a believer in success comes from asking. And it's better to be a voice than an echo. Yeah, and, and also, in terms of asking questions, a lot of times, the patients and caregivers, you could actually make a list of questions before you walk in. I think someone might have alluded I to do that. that yes. You do yes. that. It's so important because, you know, then you'll have a list prepared, and, and from the conversation, you might have additional questions, but at least you have that list so you don't walk out and say, oh, I didn't ask him that, or I should have asked him that. So. You know, I think all of these things could really help to get the most out of your, um, you know, medical teams. So one of the other questions I'd like to dig into a little deeper is, you know, there are a lot of resources, especially with the rise in internet use and things on the internet and sites and all, some of which you might feel you could trust, some of which you might feel a little apprehensive about, but what were the resources, um, Pat, that you use, say, as a, you know, for, for your husband as a patient? And then if you could also comment on what resources you used for you as a caregiver. Okay. So for my husband as a patient, um, I did use Google now and then. <laughs> Probably shouldn't admit that, but did use Google usually got all of the information off of the portal or from questions I asked the doctor. Um, I also made sure that John had downtime, that he could process everything that was going on, and that we had what I would call date nights, where we would go out to dinner or we would go out to lunch or do something um, as he doesn't drive anymore. And we don't talk about cancer or his illness at all. And that made a big difference because they live, eat, and breathe that every single day. 
they don't get the little breaks that we get as caregivers. Um, for myself, as I said, I practice Reiki. Um, I did meditation. Um, I also do a lot of walking. And that all clears my mind and clears my space. Reading, you know, different books, you know, not on cancer, but just kind of keeping and having lunch with friends now and then or going into the office because I'm still a realtor part time. Um, but those things make a big difference. You know, you have to get away from it. You have to have downtime that you can be who you are because otherwise this is all overwhelming. Um, I encourage you as I'm talking about the walking that we have Step Up for Melanoma coming in May, 10,000 steps a day. I did it last year. 10,000 steps every day for the month of May. I can't even begin to tell you how good I felt at the end of that month. And I continue to still do it today. So I'm looking forward to the challenge. <laughs> yes, it's um, the month of May because that's Skin Cancer Melanoma Awareness Month. So that's why we do it in May. And actually, I participated, was very excited that I did 10,000 steps a day, but unfortunately when it came to June, I really should have said to myself, this needs to continue, but we're working on it. So Ken, what resources did you look into to help you better understand the disease? Obviously, uh, same thing with Google, and then uh, began, started reaching out. One of the reasons I know about the Melanoma Research Alliance is reaching out and asking questions and looking on the website. And also the other melanoma, large melanoma groups that are out there as well. Uh, and then sticking to some of those groups that MD Anderson, for example, uh, where my mother-in-law was treated years ago. I knew that they had a very uh, robust uh, melanoma team, if, if you will, uh, and um, Mayo Clinic and things like that. Uh, that was really where I got started, that, that and message boards. Uh, so. And David? Dr. Google doesn't have a medical degree. <laughs> so I would just call um, Dr. Atkins' office and talk to his uh, PA or send an email and extremely, extremely responsive on anything that uh, happened. And that's when I was uh, diagnosed with diabetes. I was in the hospital for three or four days. And guess what? Dr. Atkins came to see me every day. A lesson learned from that. The other thing that I got involved with, and you'll see it in your handouts from today, is the rare registry. Um, for mucosal, acral, melanoma. Um, that was important for us as we have our Melanoma Warriors group for mucosal melanoma on Facebook. And a group of us got together to start. And the founder of this is actually here today, Julie, um, who started the whole process going. And we're excited to say that we're up and running and hopefully we'll get more um, information going forward. This is such a rare, these are such rare cancers, there's not a lot of information, as you've heard today, so we're hoping for the best. Yeah, and just a little bit more information about that for those who are interested. Um, so the MRA, a group of patients, as Pat said, um, approached the MRA a few years ago to start a direct-to-patient registry really capturing the journeys of acral and mucosal melanoma patients. I would like to say that included in this registry, we do have the more common cutaneous um, melanoma patients. Are, they are also able to join because we'd like to compare the journeys of the rare melanomas to the more common form. So this is a direct to patient registry. There are surveys to complete. Um, again, um, on different aspects of your diagnosis, demographics, treatment history. Um, and, uh, you know, we're very excited to do this. We're compiling data for it. 
And one thing that we felt was very important is to give back information to participants. So they will actually see the data that's emerging in the registry, where they fit as they answer the different questions, and also they'll get information about potential clinical trials that are applicable to them, as well as information on webinars, meetings, and other pertinent information. But, you know, the MRA is really excited um, to be part of this initiative. More information is just outside in terms of the website. And uh, it was, I have to thank my MRA team members, Cody and Renee and um, Rachel, who might not be in the audience right now, for all the hard work that they did, as well as the, our patient advisors, who are many of which are sitting in the audience, as well as um, our medical, our clinical advisors who, who've helped in the survey questions. And I know, David, do you want to comment? RareMelanoma.org. Um, I just want to ask right now if, if you had to do anything different or from the start, think about what that might have been, or maybe there was nothing you would do different, or was there more information that would have been useful? Would more support groups be, be useful? So. David? First of all, I wouldn't have gotten melanoma, and then I didn't have to learn everything about it. The, um, the, the one thing that I think is very important, when you get diagnosed with melanoma, learn the basics of what you have. And then when you go to your medical professional, it's my opinion that you are much better off going to a major medical center, and this is not to knock individual oncologists, but go to a major medical center and go to a doctor whose specialty is melanoma. I believe that that's very important because you can only know so much about different types of cancer. And um, that's, it worked for me, and hopefully it'll work for other people. Ken? Not sure if I'd do anything other than, like David said, not have melanoma to begin with. Um, but I think one thing is I would have made sure to be a little kinder to myself after I got started with, uh, with my diagnosis. Uh, and I, again, I emphasize that, that that is one thing, that positive attitude, that outlook, uh, it is to keep doing that. Uh, and as I mentioned before, you know, we more or less got to work, if you will, tackling what to do with our, what to do with the diagnosis and what we were going to do going forward. So I was very fortunate in that regard. I will also say too that having um, a cancer center that has specialty in melanoma, I think, is very important. Not everybody has access to that, they don't. but I think that I'm hoping that that is something that continues to evolve. So. <laughs> Pat, do you, yeah, well, <laughs> yes. Now that you have a mic. Um, I wouldn't change anything um, that we did. We obviously went to Mass General. We had a second opinion at Dana-Farber. We hit all the best hospitals in the region, and we're very happy with the care that we've received. Um, I would, however, suggest that people, you know, not get not do as much Googling. Some people are strapped to their computer and they look at everything. You know, I said I did look at Google a few times, but I would kind of stay away from that, you know, on the long term. Um, and I think it's important to have faith in your doctors. You know, I feel bad for the people in the Midwest and, you know, parts of the country that don't have access to the great doctors that we have on the East Coast and, you know, New York, Massachusetts, and other cities. I'm not trying to name all of them. Um, but I think, I, and I also caution you into listening to other people who have experienced the same cancer. No two journeys are the same. 
No two treatments are the same. You need to listen to your doctor and listen to what they say and suggest as treatments because by listening to everybody else, you go into that doctor and you're talking about tills and you're talking about immunotherapy and you're talking about everything else that comes down the pike and it may not fit. You know, your doctor's probably already told you what works and what doesn't work. So um, too much information is a bad thing at times. Yeah, it might be t information overload. But Pat, you mentioned something that I know, I don't know if I'm getting static. You mentioned something um, in your comment that I just want to bring out. You did go for a second opinion because yeah. I know you know, many patients and caregivers are a little reluctant to go for a second opinion. Um, I just thought maybe I'd ask the panelists, you know, their opinions about it. It was, encu it was encouraged. Mm -hmm. I mean, when we got to Mass General, this was so new to us, we'd never heard of mucosal melanoma. You know, one of my first questions was, how do you get cancer, how do you get melanoma where the sun doesn't shine? I mean, I was honest. <laughs> And still in shock, I think. Um, but anyways, that was why we went, we asked for a second opinion. And I mean, Dana-Farber is the sister hospital of Mass General, but still two entirely different doctors and two entirely different surgeons who came up with the exact same opinion. Yep, definitely. Uh, did the same thing uh, with my initial diagnosis. And also, when the cancer spread to my adrenal gland, the radiation guys were thinking that they could zap the tumor, but we didn't feel comfortable with it. So my main oncologist overruled those guys because we kept asking questions and said, no, let's go the immunotherapy route, which I'm glad we did two years later now. So. I did not ask for a second opinion, although it's advisable. I thought that uh, the first connection was just fine, and um, I didn't know that uh, I could do better than Dr. Atkins. The one thing on a couple of questions before is uh, the one thing that I found very difficult to do is manage the roller coaster ride every month during infusions, um, managing scans and then talking to the doctor. And I think that over the last, or I know that over the last five years, I can now go for a CT scan and within an hour and a half at Georgetown, I have the results on my phone. And a lot of times when you go for a blood test, I have the results of the blood test, know exactly what to look for, and I have that um, again, on my phone before Dr. Atkins comes in the room. But uh, the, the other thing is I used to get scans on Thursday and Friday and then have an appointment on Tuesday. Big mistake because it kind of ruined my weekend. I didn't know what to expect. I didn't have the results in the, in the early years. So now I will go on Monday and have an appointment on Tuesday, and I feel a lot better, a lot more relaxed, and um, I don't have to, I really don't have to wait that long um, to get the results, and luckily, everything's been really good so far. That's great, yeah, waiting periods can be extremely, as we know, strenuous. So, Cody, do we have time for a few questions yeah. from the audience? Or does everyone want to go to uh, the reception? Anyone? <laughs> yeah. oh, okay. I have one, uh, and then the Amy can go. I, I just have a quick question for folks who might be recently diagnosed. Do you have any piece of, of wisdom or advice for, for, for those folks who are just kind of starting their journeys with melanoma? Gather as much information as you can, which I think one of us said a few moments ago. Um, believe in yourself, believe in what 
what you can do and as you mentioned believe in your care team uh, but ask a lot of questions make your care team work for that belief and um, know that you're not alone that's one thing from today uh, that everyone should understand we're all on the same journey together and there's lots and that was one thing that I did not know 11 12 years ago that there were so many people like me who were on this journey so know that you're not alone I made that offer at lunch and I'm serious somebody ever wants to call me email me text me please do I'd love to talk with you I do that as well uh, for Emmerman's Angels and some other organizations so. actually so do I and um, it's a rewarding experience to talk to somebody who is new with melanoma who was very apprehensive and I never really look for that nor did I know it was there when I was first diagnosed but uh, the attitude I believe is uh, a big helper positive attitude as the caregiver, remember you're on a roller coaster for a while. You're going to be, you know, you're going to be the cheerleader. You're going to be the support person. You're going to be the person that, you know, talks to your children and you know, grandchildren, whatever, you know, about all of this. Um, but know that it's also a very rewarding experience and that you just need to take some time for yourself. Um, whoever you're caregiving for, is going to need extra attention at times, but you need to take some time for yourself. Otherwise, you're going to burn out. You're going to hit a wall. And believe me, I've hit that wall a few times. So was there another question? Nope. And just like everyone else said, if anybody wants to give me a call, I'm happy to talk to anybody about caregiving. So I know we kind of went through, um, you know, to just answer a question, your advice to newly diagnosed patients, but, you know, let's conclude with like a minute statement of, you know, again, what's the real take home message that you want to send to the, the broader audience of patients who might be at all different stages of their disease? David, do you want to start? Sure. It is, um, the diagnosis is what's very, very difficult. And um, once you get through that, you get your team, to, your medical team together, um, which I think is very important, and you know you're in good hands. Just follow their guidelines, do whatever you're supposed to do, show up on time, do your homework, know the basics of melanoma, know what a CT scan is, know what immunology treatment is, and uh, go for it. And most likely, after looking at a lot of the slides today and the medical professionals that we're talking, you'll have a good outcome. And I, too, feel free to call me, to email me, and all, that, all of our contact information, I believe, is in one of the brochures, or you can get it from the MRA. Thank you. Thank you, Dave. Ken? Okay. Um, you're a survivor beginning day one plus. That's something that everybody, again, as I mentioned a moment ago, day one, you're a survivor, and you need to remember that and to continue fighting. And you're not alone. You're not alone. As the caregiver, you have to be the one who is, again, cheerleading. But you need to also remember that you, you help support the person you're taking care of. You may not always agree with their decisions. And you need to be prepared for that. Because at some point, there may be a decision that needs to be made that they may make on their own. And it may not be the decision you want them to make. But, you know, you have to be there to support that. Um, I just went through that with another family member who passed away in January who made a decision that his wife was not in favor of, but he made that decision. So I wanted to pass, pass that along. It doesn't always go well, <laughs> um, or as we expect. But keep the faith. Call me if you need any help. I'm always there to rah-rah, and I'll push you into walking. Yeah. 
hopefully you'll push me too. So anyway, I also want to um, say that you know, please feel free to reach out to the MRA. We have, you know, an excellent, excellent resources. Cody Barnett, as you know, like he created this whole program today with support from Renee and others at the MRA. But, um, you know, whatever we can do to provide the information that you need, please feel free to reach out to us. Like We're the available. the Melanoma Exchange. Yeah. Excuse me? The Melanoma Exchange. Oh, and the Melanoma Exchange. Do you want to talk about that, Ken? Well, other than... A couple of, who's here? It's Keith and TJ. We have a great online community. Yeah, they have a great, it's a great online community if you've never uh, interacted with these folks before. Uh, and I also consider many of the people uh, who interact their friends. Uh, and we've worked together on many projects. So you're in good hands, I would say. Yeah. If you guys would agree, you're in good hands. So. Thank you. Thank you, Kim, for bringing that up. So I just want to thank the three panelists. Um, you know, I'm hoping the audience and all of the participants got a lot of information. Um, you know, their stories and their answers were very insightful. And again, um, you know, thank you for being here. I don't know, Cody, do you have closing remarks? I, I do, but I promise they'll be really quick. <laughs> OK, so we're going to hand it over to Cody, and then we could all go to the reception. Thank you. Thank you, David. Thank you, Joan. Thank you, Pat. And thank you, Ken, uh, for a fantastic conversation. Um, I, I fully understand that I am between you and the reception, and I am going to speed us right along, but there are just a couple of things that I have to, have to do. Uh, first and foremost, I, I, I want to thank you all for being here, for participating uh, with, with, with such gusto, for being willing to ask questions and be vulnerable, and to support one another, because that's really what we're here to do. Uh, I also want to thank the sponsors who made this event possible. At the presenting level, Bristol Myers Squibb and Merck. At the gold level, Agenis, BioNTech, Castle Biosciences, DermTech, and IOVANCE Biotherapeutics. We also have a, a slew of sponsors at the silver level that, again, we, we really do need all of their support to make this possible and are just so grateful for everyone's support. Uh, overall, I, I really hope that you all leave with some new ideas, some new connections, and a, and a renewed sense of purpose. Uh, as a community of patients, caregivers, doctors, and more, we really are stronger together, and, and I hope that, that today and the rest of the scientific retreat really brings that home for you. So, so thank you again. Uh, the, the reception is on the lobby level in, uh, there's a terrace. Uh, if your back is to the exit, it's on your right-hand side. Uh, there are um, heavy hors d'oeuvres and lots of drinks, and, and, and it's really a fantastic time to mix and mingle with the, the researchers and clinicians who will be joining us for the rest of the week for the scientific retreat. So, so please stop by, say hello, meet the MRA team, and, and yeah, just continue to, to do what you're doing. Thanks so much. <laughs>